first time ever. Hear you loud and clearly. Um, and it was going place. That stuff's great. But the game is not a roguelike. Boomer shooter. <laughs> Bang. Hello, this is John St. John, and you're listening to KWEP In The Keep, bringing you all the hits from the finest in the world of gaming and entertainment. Now sit back and relax as the drowned god Cathala lulls your mind with the tastiest talk in town. Welcome to another chapter of In The Keep Podcast. I'm your very own prophet of the drowned god, the Motherlode. The Keep is a collective of gaming enthusiasts compelled by the drowned god Cathala to frag and jib one another into oblivion for all eternity. We are back, and we have to give some context to this interview because... You and I did the mother of all podcasts, like, that no one will ever hear. The Lost Podcast. Three hours of... Rambling? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, but that's the whole point. <laughs> and and it was like, I was so excited, like, immediately after we were done, I was just like, okay, can I get this thing ready to go? And it was gone. Like, I, I don't know if it saved to the wrong place. It's probably still on my computer, like, deep down in some mm. hidden... Wow, it's actually not. I I like tore my hard drive almost oh, completely to bits. I, I felt bad for you. I even more, called more than I a, felt bad for myself because I can do this every day. You know, like mm. but this is your sort of thing. I can. I think it's a weird combination though because you encourage your guests to talk about as you know varied topics, not necessarily sticking to game development and. For most of them, I've I, I've listened to quite a number of shows. They they don't tend to do that much. They kind of try to stick to their. I have like a, such a wide. I don't. I'm not trying to brag here, but I have <laughs> such a. Let's just say I'm so disorganized in my thoughts that I'll talk about anything, <laughs> you know, like, and I, I won't even think about the thing I'm supposed to be talking about until until it's too late. Sometimes so. Well, the truth is that I've grown tired of just talking about people's games. So yeah, like, yeah. It's, it, it, no, it, it depends on the guest, too. Like, some people just want to talk about their game and get the heck out of here. And I'm like, okay, cool. Sure. And some people, you know, just want to ch- like talk. And that's great. I think that's fantastic. And hope, uh, again, I've, I've said this many times, but like, I hope that they grow to like you as a person, not as just sure. the guy who made the game that they made. And then, then they'll go buy your stuff because they like you like, or not. They'll be like, that guy sucks. And <laughs> he shouldn't have talked to that guy because that guy also sucks. Right. And I'm never going to buy their game. So it could uh, go both ways, right? Yes. So speaking of going off topic, what yeah. black Sabbath album were you listening to? Uh, today this? I actually listened to their very recent for me, recent album 13. Mm. But this was after a couple days of listening to their whole discography, which I haven't done in a while. Like in high school, that's all I listened to. But um, now it's like once a year, I'll get into them for like a month and then go back and do other stuff. But uh, I don't really have to listen to their music because it's it's already like embedded into my soul, sort of. (laughs) I can call up the songs mentally if I need to, but uh, yeah, they're good. So are you Aussie guy or a Dio guy? Definitely Aussie. Uh, you know, that's the first. But Dio's, the two albums, he well, he did three albums, but we don't talk about the third one. The two albums he did with them initially in the early 80s, I think they're, they rival the Aussie stuff, to be honest. They, they are really strong. Like as a band I, too, they were like super tight by then. And I, uh, I, I mean, I like the idea that they're two different bands. Honestly, yeah, like I like yeah. Heaven and Hell and Black Sabbath and separate them in my mind, right? Because it, it's really very different music. Dio it brought a, almost a rock and roll thing to Sabbath that had been well, they had that early on, and then they kind of really dove into like the 
true doom metal, whatever you yeah. want to call it. Yeah, a little more mystical. Like, but, but yeah. yeah, like Master of Reality, like that. That's like one of the best records ever made. Like just so good. All the that's way kind of where their their sound crystallized. I think it's just, yeah. they created that sound. The, then, the worse Ozzy is in his life, the better his his art. <laughs> Sadly, <laughs> that can happen, right? The artist a, has to struggle. I was having a really in depth conversation with my friend about Ozzy Osbourne yesterday because he was just like, you know, how is he so dumb and makes <laughs> such good music? Like, how could someone just coast through a lot? Like, who who writes all these lyrics? I was right. like, well, Geezer Butler, <laughs> and Geezer then Sharon. <laughs> I guess I don't know who wrote all of Ozzy's like Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah, I'm not stuff. sure actually. Uh, I'm sure he must have had a hand in it. I know he comes up with the melodies, like, and he's he's a genius at that. Like, you give him a song and he'll make an accompaniment to that, yeah, that guitar riff or whatever, and it's it's perfect usually. When you hear about um, like people with dementia, they can, like my great grandmother was, was one of these. Like, she had severe dementia but okay. she always remembered me specifically me like my my brother could walk in the room and she wouldn't know who she'd ask where i was <laughs> it yeah. was really weird wow and then she always remembered lyrics to music like i would put oh, on cool. stuff from when she was a you know a girl like louis uh louis armstrong that, you know, that kind of okay. shit and, and she would just remember every word but she for nothing else is all totally oh, gone so for the last two or three years of her life must and occupy a different part of your brain right it, like exactly that. and that, that's my theory with ozzy like mm. i think he's crazy like he totally yeah. d- disorganized schizophrenic or something i'm not right. I'm no i'm no <laughs> psychologist but and then but the the music and tonality and everything that comes with that just seems to work right for him right yeah but like Black Rain, I mean, he didn't write the lyrics to Black Rain, did he? That was like... Is this a more recent Ozzy? I, I, uh, unfortunately, I lost, I lost some of my... Uh, I didn't follow him after... Whew, man, it must be in the 90s. I haven't really f- kept up with him. Other than that Black Sabbath album. I'm hmm. a... I'm a huge fan of Zach Wild, so I yeah. like Ozzy, like No More Tears and Black right. Rain. Right, right, right. I think it was the one after that, after No More Tears was um, Osmosis. Yeah. I think that's the last Ozzy album I bought. I I always think about them, like, yeah, I'll probably buy another one at some point or listen to it, but I haven't gotten around to it. <laughs> it's okay. We have a long-term relationship, <laughs> me and Ozzy. <laughs> We take these breaks from each other. <laughs> <laughs> so to get back on track, because yeah. I, I actually got like, somebody wrote me like the last time oh, when the Doombringer episode, they were like, you can't spend 15 minutes talking Shoot. about yes. freaking habanero vodka before you start talking about Doombringer. So let's I, yeah, at I least break the too. ice and, and then we'll get back off track. It was Maleki Treral who did it. He's a, he's another supporter of the show. Nice. So it's fine. But he, he got me. I was like, okay. You know I, what? I don't want to get you in trouble again. So I don't care if I get in trouble. It's, he can fist fight me. He's got his own podcast now, but it's all in Portuguese. Oh, nice. Uh, you know, do you know who he is? Is like, he the guy that does the translations? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I didn't realize they were the same guy. Yeah. You shared... I think I was talking to you about him yesterday. With yeah. The, yeah. Anyway. So, yeah, he does this whole podcast about like uh, – just translating, I guess, or localizing and specifically the Brazilian branch of that. And cool. I can't like, well, it's not fair for you to leave comments on my YouTube video, man, because how am I supposed to like do it back to you? I can't stick one in there. Like, I don't know what the <laughs> hell you're talking about the whole time. And I'm not going to learn Portuguese. So. Okay. So his podcast is in Portuguese. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. I, I was telling him like maybe you should do both like do some in English and so yeah. like Shazik used to do that with Beyond Strip Jumping and he was like oh we have a French guest today we're going to speak in French and isolate ninety nice. percent of our audience. But, <laughs> I mean do whatever you want that's the beauty of it anyway. Well, that works right into <laughs> the game content yes because yes. I I was there's this one player on my game Star Explorers and every time I put out an update and I've done this a lot recently he he posts like can you please translate this into Russian? Right. <laughs> and I, I, I'd love to do that. I'd, I'd love to do 
something like that for for the players uh and potentially you know reach other more people but you uh, saw what happened with ion fury right where the the community just like took up the the task oh really yeah there's like the community just popped up like we're going to translate this into russian for you wow. and then bam nice. and uh, hey. full full russian localization i don't know how good it is but right that's really well you really could cool. do like a google translate <laughs> with this probably end up isolating people um, save fred a few bucks <laughs> yeah no i mean I, i'd love to do it it's it's logistically i'm not sure the game was not designed to be multi-language like i didn't think that far ahead back in 2013 when i started it so what can you do but i think it's possible and uh once I'm done with the major updates I'm doing, probably I will definitely have a look at it, see if I can just isolate all the strings and put them in an external file and then just swap out folders or something like that as needed. Swap out files so you can throw other languages in there. Yeah, I believe it should just be selectable. You know, like yeah. I want to play in Russian, bam, done. Right, right. Um, the but, only concern I have is for like the menus and stuff, then I'd have to make new images and that could get pretty tedious, but maybe I'm thinking have like a, a mouse hover function. Mm-hmm. So even if the menu is in English, you could hover the mouse over it and then the Russian or German or whatever Swedish term would pop up for the player. That could be a, a nice solution for that. I'm thinking out loud right now because I haven't thought this through yet. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. That's how you learn. That's how you get through things. You talk to yourself out loud <laughs> when other someone people else are is patiently <laughs> waiting. <laughs> no. Right. Uh, but that's what you need. If this is what we have to do to get you to work on Star Explorers, and we'll do it once a week. You know, like long. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I'll public. just sit here, and then you can the you can judge me. Yeah. So, so but yeah, like there's. Uh, obviously localizing the the game would open you up to a whole huge new audience because potentially like, yeah. Russians don't tend to speak English. Uh, Brazilians apparently don't tend to speak English. Um, right. right. Apparently everybody in Indi- India does. Cause it's like, boom, but in the keep podcast is going crazy in India right now. Yeah. I, I heard that. Yeah. I saw that. That's pretty and cool. And then, so, like your major major languages, like to to reach the whole world as best as you can, mm. cost effectively, you got to do Russian, Hindi, uh, Mandarin, probably, and okay. then maybe Spanish. Oh, Spanish is definitely way okay. up there. That's like the second biggest language in the world, I think. I, I would probably do German because yeah. I'm German, and my mom <laughs> does translations to German, so get her involved. Oh, that'd but, be pretty uh, cool. Yeah. Russian I'd love to do because one of my favorite games is Stalker, which mm-hmm. the game Stalker, I don't think that's Russian. That's Ukrainian, but the book it was based on was Russian. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know how that works. The game is the game based on the same book that, uh, disc- what was his name? Roadside. Tar- Tarkovsky. Yeah. Tarkovsky yeah, Roadside, was the, the alien, the yeah. alien book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. So I've never read the book. I've only oh, okay. seen the film. Oh, the books are excellent. And he's one of those, they, because it's two brothers. They're one of those authors that I've been trying to follow up with and, and try to get all their stuff. And it's it's always, they've got like three or four, maybe five books that have pretty much blown my mind. They're they're excellent. And their other stuff is good too. It's not not all at the same level, but it's it's all really good. So the Strzatsky brothers. It's one or, of the best movies I've ever seen. Yeah. The movie was, I've only seen it once and I saw it. I remember I signed up for Netflix just to be able to see that movie back in the day when it was uh, DVDs. And then, um, ended up going with the streaming option, mm-hmm. but, uh, I did get a chance to see the film, which was excellent. Hockey to, um, the, he he's he's the one who told me to watch it because I wasn't familiar with Tarkovsky at all. Okay, he's just like, you got to watch this movie, and yeah. it's 
I mean, it's one of those movies that I can't imagine like showing, you know, Hey, everybody come over and we're going to drink and watch no. this movie with, <laughs> you know, where the, most of the shots are just looking at fish and water for right. long periods of time. It's very strange. <laughs> it's, it's people aren't used to that. They want like slam right. pack and nothing really happens either. There's no action really. It's just like dialogue and setting and mood and, it's a lost art form, I feel. One scene that really stuck in my brain was it was kind of like an an old dilapidated building mm-hmm. with tiles. And there was like water running over these tiles. And it Yeah. The scene lasted a long time. I, I don't remember exactly how long. But that is what stuck in my brain from that movie. Like more than anything. I don't know why. So what like what I know that there's difference between the book and the film, but like oh, what, big difference. What's the plot of the the book? The book is actually a lot more like the game, Stalker. Okay, although it's not as, I mean, there is a military presence, like trying to keep people out of the zone, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the movie touched on that as well. Uh, but then in the book, you do have these anomalies, which and and different artifacts and stuff kind of can tear people apart or and the artifacts that they kind of smuggle out of there each one has like a different purpose or different sort of effect that they don't quite understand and there's zombies in there and so a lot of the elements of the game you can see they're drawn directly from the book you might not notice it right away because i've read it a couple times and it's not like it doesn't obviously read like a video game you know it's more Mm -hmm. character character driven and stuff uh, but when you look a little deeper, you see, yeah, they, they pulled these ideas. But I think they also pulled ideas from some of their other books because I've been reading those. There's one called Far Rainbow, which is set on a different planet. And it has this like thing called a wave. And the wave is like something that comes over the surface of the planet and it can destroy stuff or whatever. It sounds a lot like the emissions that they talk about in the in the Stalker games. Um, and I, th- I always thought they probably pulled it from there because it doesn't mention those in the roadside picnic. Huh? I got to play Stalker. Like I, I've had too many people tell me how much it meant to them to not at this it, point. It might be one of those situations where, you know, the time for that may have passed the window of opportunity. I don't know. You'll, you'll only know if you try it though. Right. Well, this is one of those things that I like purposefully do to myself and enjoy. It's like my weird hobby that I like to forcibly play things that probably sh- like I, I probably shouldn't enjoy because <laughs> of it's outdated. Like I right, did Arx right. Fatalis, like I with okay. the mod the uh, Arx Liberator, whatever the hell it's called. To re- like, I really wanted to experience that game because I knew it was nice. such a big influence on uh, Head On, and so right now I just bought Betrayal at Crondor. Because I really want to understand what, wh- why is Call of Seregnar so special to uh, Damian, who's making it, right? And I feel like Stalker is probably like on that list somewhere. It's just sure, uh, sure. I got to figure it out. I've seen I've seen a lot of it, like you know, watching people play it and stuff like that. Just because like, I had, well, I'm going to talk about that better familiarize myself with it, but I haven't played it myself. Nice. Yeah, it's definitely worth it. I I got it in 2010. I think was when I first encountered it which is like three years after it came out. I'd heard of it, yeah, but I didn't really play like horror type games too much. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then it was on Steam for like two ninety nine, And I was like, oh, it, okay, it looks pretty cool. It's yeah. kind of overwhelming yeah. to jump into because I've looked into like, okay, I should play Stalker before. Yeah. And then there's, you know, y- you basically can't run it just vanilla and have a good experience for this. What? everyone tells me. So mm. then there's all these different options for like the update mods that will, you know, some of them preserve some of the, you know, jankiness to kind of yeah. keep the same thing. And some of them totally fix it. But some, then people are like, well, you don't want to play it like that because it's not the real experience. And Right. And I, I would recommend yeah. a, a vanilla playthrough to be honest. Okay. Well, if that's what you recommend, then I'll try. Because what I found with the mods, unless you can find a mod that just fixes bugs, which would be great. But most of them, they upset the game balance quite a bit. They make items too easy to find sometimes, uh, or they give you too much money, things like that, you know, and it kind of, 
for me, it's I, I've already played through it on vanilla, so I got that experience. But I felt like if I had played through without that experience, I wouldn't have liked it as much. It would have been too easy or too, you know. So I don't know. That might make it easier to get into, though, without having to worry about mods. What I'm not interested in is making significant progress and then losing my save. <laughs> like, that I won't. No. I, that's Nobody a wants. red line, can't do it kind of thing for me. Like, because I'm not uh, going to go back and That only me. happened to me in Clear Sky. Okay. Where I had to, I had to go back a few saves. <laughs> but as long as you save fairly regu- regularly, it should be should be fine i'm the world's worst man i yeah. know i'm supposed to save and I, I always just get lost like i've been playing uh smay 2 which is the hmm. the finished mappers quake jam and okay. we, we played it co-op uh that was great but like i have this habit when i play custom quake maps it's easier when it's on quake spasm there's checkpoints and all that but when it's just i'm just playing a map by myself I always get lost and I'm like, Oh, this is so amazing. And then I play through a bunch of it and I totally forget to save die. And I'm like, well, fuck, uh, not doing that again. And then that ends up discouraging me from finishing a lot of stuff that I really yeah, want to that finish. can, that can ruin a whole like, gaming experience. So I don't know, some, some form of like, Hey, quake client makers, some form of just a nice audio save that doesn't require me to think about it would go a long way. Checkpoints. <laughs> Yeah. Well, in multiplayer, like w- the co op thing, that to- no problem. You know, right, you die right. and then you respond at the most recent checkpoint. It's sure. Smay 2 is fantastic so far. Like, I haven't finished it yet, but man. Is it like a whole campaign? Mm hmm. Based on it's, original Quake? Well, it's like seven maps that kind of all intertwine, you know? Hmm. I don't know that there's a story behind it, or at least I haven't found one yet, but it's just like seven of the best Quake mappers from Finland with oh, nice. Morpher doing all the music and stuff for it. And and, and it's a novelty because it's, I, I don't know of any other, maybe there was like one Quake map packs that were specifically meant for co-op play because okay. it's just not very popular in Quake. Right. Um, I didn't even know it was possible in, in the original Quake. I thought, Quake two introduced that, but I, I, well, it's you know you use different Quake Spasm spiked is the okay. what we use to play multiplayer, and you know it's basically a uh, net Quake that's just been you know modded and tweaked and updated. Oh, nice. Then you can use it for co op instead of just using it for shooting each other in the arena. <laughs> right, right. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, the co op stuff is probably my favorite aspect of multiplayer. mm Hmm. I, I, I tried Quake 3 and Unreal Tournament back in the day and I would get killed like immediately and I was like, you know, I'm not that competitive a person. <laughs> I could probably spend time and get better and, and compete with these people, but yeah, I don't have that kind of energy. Uh, but when, um, what was it, Left 4 Dead came out, mm-hmm. I think I, I felt like that was almost a casual game because you don't have like these, you have very short you know, play sessions and you don't really save any info from one to the next. It's kind of a fresh start each time. So I played it single player, like expecting to enjoy it and I liked it, but it was kind of like really designed to be played multiplayer, you know, like for sure. Yeah. For, and the type of multiplayer. Dead. Yeah. Uh, the fact that you kind of had to work together as a team to get through those things. I thought that was a really cool game mechanic that, Reminded me way back of the of the Goonies. Uh, I don't know if you ever played the very old, what was it, Atari like Atari eight hundred computer? Uh, no. They had a Goonies. <laughs> yeah. How old the, do you think I was when the Atari eight hundred yeah. came out? <laughs> you were not alive yet. I was not even. So a there's a movie called The Sons. Goonies. Yeah. You're probably familiar with that. The Truffle Shuffle, right? Truffle Shuffle. I've never seen the Goonies. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it was a good movie back in the day. Uh, Spielberg produced it, so it was kind of a big deal. Uh, But then they made a video game, which resembled the movie a little bit, but, you know, it was more of a game uh, than a story. And But you have two players, two people on the screen at any given time, and they had to operate together to get through whatever puzzle 
So if there was like this big rock that was smashing down, one player could run around and pull on a lever to stop the rock from coming down. Mm-hmm. The other player got to go through and then uh, pull on another lever to kind of allow the other player through. So they had to kind of coordinate their efforts getting through these maps. And that was what Left for Dead reminded me of because, you know, it's in a different way, of course, more action based. Have you ever played Portal 2? I have. Yeah. Did you play it co op? No. I'll do it with you. That's oh, okay. fun. It's yeah. like exactly what you're describing, but. Oh, no kidding. I, I played through the whole game. Me. I didn't even realize it would be different on it's multiplayer. Super fun. Yeah. Okay. It, it really utilizes that, you know, like you, you know, you and your partner have to cooperate in order to solve the puzzles and it's okay, so much thanks. fun. Yeah, I'd like to try that sometime. That sounds cool. Uh, it's been a while since I played it. That was like one of my really good pastimes with a friend is like, well, you know, let's let's play. We spent like a month playing Portal 2. I think we did uh, Bloodborne together because I, at the time, could not okay. beat Bloodborne by myself. That was not going to happen. So <laughs> I nice. had no patience for that sort of game. I haven't Years played later, Blood, here Bloodborne. I am. That I'm was like a PS, PS3 game, right? Bloodborne. Yeah. Uh, P- I PS2, think I played maybe? it on the PS3. I, th- okay. I think I played it on the PS3. Maybe I PS4. never had a PlayStation anything, so. I still have a PS4. I probably nice. played Bloodborne on the PS4 now that I think about it. But okay. Yeah, I just. Somebody was t- talking to me yesterday about like Xbox. I have an Xbox Series X one says, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Like, <laughs> I'm no not idea. alone in that. Then. Okay, good. Yeah. We, we have an Xbox 360. We got it for free when we mm-hmm. signed up for AT&T cable. So <laughs> what? That's, that's as far as my Xbox. You guys have cable? Goes. Well, mm-hmm. no internet, whatever. Oh, yeah. okay. No, you know what? We might've gotten cable back then. Yeah. But we don't have it anymore. It's all the same, isn't it? Like, uh, Not exactly. It's like smart TVs basically filled that same yeah. niche, though. I mean, some people totally still have cable, especially like yeah. sports fans. Like, it's, okay, um, yeah, there's the premium channels and all that. Yeah, but I'm sure. They yeah, are. I don't have cable, and every time that I see, like, I go somewhere and someone has cable, or like, I, I took my wife on a little vacation, hmm. and we were staying you know, in this Airbnb out in the mountains, and they had cable, and I was like, whoa, wow. And, just turned on like comedy central and watched South park all night. And, <laughs> and like commercials just blow my mind. I'm like, I, what are these? Like, this is You're right. So you have to wait. Weird. For <laughs> Especially late night comedy central commercials. Cause it's all like dating apps and <laughs> like okay. pills you can take to, you know, enhance yourself and such things like that. Uh, or like lawyer, like I, it's been so long since I've seen like a, a ambulance chasing lawyer. commercial. Right. Yeah. Those are great. I love the medication ads too. Like yeah, I'm yeah. remotely qualified to decide what kind of medications I need. Right? <laughs> like, that sounds like good. Classic, like uh, comedian joke. Like, well, what are the side effects? Well, certain death, uh, but it will cure your depression. <laughs> Internal bleeding. There's always the, some kind of bleeding. Involved. Every like antidepressant commercial the side effect is always like suicidal thoughts. I'm like, what? That's what I'm taking the medication to get rid of. Like, not, not to at all make light of people who, who need those things. I'm sure there, there are very valid reasons for those. Oh, I've, uh, I've been through it, man. I, I yeah. was on, uh, well, for like a week wow. and it had exactly the same. Like I was already really depressed. And then I, one week of Wellbutrin and I was like, I'm definitely going to do it now. (laughs) And my doctor was like, no, 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 no. That one's not working. Prozac uh, worked for me. I took Prozac for about a year and then rebalanced my life. And it it was like, it it didn't fix my depression. It just kind of made me numb, but it Mm. gave me the room I needed to address the underlying issues that were causing a lot of my depression. That's Yeah. You don't hear that, but is that something the doctor kind of talked to you about? Yeah, because okay. um, it, it, it feels it was like from the outside, I, I've never uh, been directly, you know, uh, involved in a depression type situation. So thankfully, uh, but it's very hard yeah. to explain to people because you know, yeah, I would you imagine. haven't felt it. You haven't felt it. But right. Right. 
That was a it was a long I don't I don't mean to derail this thing to start just talking no. about myself but since we're addressing like hey we should talk about the depression uh, we should talk about the game a un- little bit more <laughs> in case people start losing interest. <laughs> <laughs> See I, I I don't have that inner drive to like talk about my my stuff so I expect you to do that. That's let's, your job. <laughs> let's try to tie it in here. So if you were on a spaceship, right, like, and yeah. you were uh, sent out and you're isolated because you're all alone from everyone and you don't get the, the much needed human interaction you need, perhaps yeah. you might become depressed. Oh. And in this you know, situation, you probably have a replicator that can make exactly the right thing for you, like this, perfect do- dosage, perfect like chemical makeup for your specific brain. That's like – the future of antidepressants or whatever. There you go. Um, but currently, you know, it's just designer drugs and they're like, well, that sounds like I'm talking about MDMA. Never mind. Uh, it's d- d- drugs that are like, okay, we sell them in these, like these doses and you can choose which of these doses is appropriate hmm. to give to your patient. And there are several different kinds that have sort of different chemical makeups um, and affect the brain in different ways. And some people, react better to like an SSRI than they do to other forms of okay. uh, antidepressants drugs. And with the, some of them, um, SSRIs are serotonin inhibitors essentially. So serotonin is the chemical in your brain that is associated with things like pleasure. And, you know, okay. so some folks don't have enough serotonin production or they have too much and then they run out. So like, a Oh, I see. Like, a, again, I have to say this twice now. I'm not a psychologist. You're right. I just did some research on it because it affected me. Uh, so, like, some people will have, like, a huge flux of serotonin, you know, so they have, like, a manic period. Hmm. And then their brain runs out of it, and it takes a while to reproduce it. So then they have a crushing depression where they can't, like... Can't function. Yeah. So the SSRI if I understand this correctly is inhibiting that overproduction or that over oh, okay. stimulation that kind way it keeps you them... nice and smooth. Yeah. Mm. Okay. That, that actually makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so, all right, let's actually talk about star Explorer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, 30 minutes added in, a... I doubled it. <laughs> <laughs> so you did an update. You did a bunch of updates. Recently. I'm doing a lot of small updates to the testing branch. And then mm-hmm. when they're all done and everything's worked out and all the bugs are crushed, I'm mm-hmm. going to put out a major update, like one big update for the, the default branch. Um, and I'm going to use up my last like steam visibility round for that. Uh, hopefully, you know, getting a lot of attention on the game so somehow. Let's assume that the people listening to this, Heard your last appearance on the show, not the yeah. one that we lost, but right. you know the last. So from that point, they've they were like, okay, I'll wait and see how it goes before I buy it. And then right. now here we are. So you've updated it. There's tornadoes now. There's mm-hmm. like let, let's meteors. Me through all that. Like you meteors, can get hit yeah. by meteor showers now. Uh, like out in space, you've got asteroids and stuff. Mm-hmm. That's been there for a while. But now on the planets, certain planets in the right conditions you'll get a meteor shower. Uh, so that could be a, you know, potential hazard. Yeah. Uh, the tornadoes. Um, I recently added a whole alien, like civilization. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, so they have like a city on one of the planets where they, they come from. It's like their home planet. So you can go there and explore and, and talk to them. And uh, One thing, a feature that my players requested a lot, and I just added it, was, uh, I like that he's your player now. <laughs> my players. Oh, not, okay. Not singular. <laughs> okay. There's more than one. <laughs> <laughs> it's just me. <laughs> right. <laughs> so they, they asked for some way to uh, link up your backpack storage with your ship's storage, right? Because it was kind of tedious to have to go back to the ship and, and sort things out every time. So you can like now to- buy an upgrade that... It's called like a, I call it the wormhole 2000. 
So it like creates a wormhole between your you know backpack. What, you know what I'm going to say about this, right? <laughs> I have no idea what you're going to say. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> keep going. Keep going. That's why I'm going to keep talking. So it creates a wormhole between your backpack and your ship's storage, and you can just swap items wherever you are, uh, whether you're on a planet or anywhere. You know, you don't have to go back to your ship for that each time. Effectively increasing your storage capacity. Yeah. One one thing that I did struggle with was uh, when I ran out of storage space, I was trying to throw shit on the ground and just like, oh, I'll just leave it in the ship and it'll still be there. Yeah, nope. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, you can't wrong. do that in the ship. Was, I, yeah. I, I'm going to write that down because I should be able to do that. Mm. Drop uh, stuff in ship. Oh, it's man, totally inherently. possible to do. It just, I never, Yeah. I have to make it happen, you know. You can do it on it's the planets. A, it's a balance thing because it's like um, inherently it is a survival game. So I mean, mm. the, the, that's the conscript or Resident Evil things like. Uh, hopefully, I get to talk to JD sixty four about conscript soon. But the the thing with a survival game is that you have to choose what supplies are worth right. keeping and that kind of thing. So I mean, that's up to you. You're the game. You're a designer. You're a game yeah. designer, professional. Ah. So uh, I'll let you decide if that's something you want to do, but. Because I wasn't angry about it. It was just, oh, I noticed this. Kind of okay. Thing. No, that's fair. Uh, um, going I back wrote it to down. That doesn't mean to I'm going to do it, for sure. Exactly where you dropped an item. Now, that's a different story. That's... Right. Well, I mean, if you drop an item on a planet, it will stay there. But until when you leave that planet, then it's gone. Oh, right? okay. But if you leave it in a storage box, then it will stay. Assuming everything's working. Yeah. I was talking about Arx Fatalis earlier, and yeah. um, so there's this. Uh, you've, have you ever played it? Or anything? I have not. I, I'm going to spoil something for That's you fine. and for everyone else listening. Everyone should know this before you play Arx Fatalis. There's these statues you get, um, and you don't really know why you get them, mm. and they don't seem all that important. And it is extremely important not to lose the statues. Oh. Uh-huh. Don't drop them in some random place because that's what I did. Um, and you're because you need can't them later. progress, you will need them later. Oh, you okay. absolutely will need all of them. So I would and call that a game design flaw. I would too, but okay. but it's like such a great game. Otherwise, that like I'm not yeah, going to let yeah. that one thing ruin it. So what I did was I just no clip through the, the door and <laughs> <laughs> continued on. Okay. But the issue is that um. Uh, Arx was originally designed in a four by three aspect ratio. Hmm. And so on the, the mod, I'm sure they've probably found this out and fixed it since then, but the mod, the version of that mod that I played Arx Liberatus, Libertitis, something like that. Liberty, Arx Liberty. We're going to call it that. The, uh, the, the way the game f- functions is that you, if you want to use cheat codes of any kind, they're all like different combinations of the spells and the spells are these things okay. that you have to kind of like draw on screen. You have to hold down the spell button, you draw a symbol on the screen oh, interesting. and you do different patterns and all that. Um, but some of them are really, really, really like, I mean, one in a hundred chance you get it right kind of thing to draw because it's been expanded out to 16 by nine and the cursor is oh. still moving in a four by three. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and that That's was rough. painful. So I spent like two or three days repeatedly trying to do this. Wow. <laughs> like I just need to no clip through this door. I'm not going to go find that item. I probably dropped yeah. it in a swamp somewhere way earlier in the game. Uh, Th- that reminds me of, uh, one of the older Zelda games, mm. uh, the, the Ocarina of time. And then like wind waker, you had to memorize these songs you know, they're really short, like four notes, but you still had to kind of memorize them and play them uh, to get the effect you wanted to. The later Zeldas kind of put the notes on the screen for you as you're playing them, so you didn't have to memorize them, which I felt I like was like Ocarina a gives of, you a, a songbook, right? Like I think you can go back and reference what? it, yes. Yeah. But when you're playing it, you have to know it. Yeah. You know, you have to have it in your mind, Uh which I thought I like that, like it made you learn something. Whereas I think it was Twilight Princess kind of took that element out and said, "No, everyone's going to be able to play this game." Uh, it made it, but for me, I felt like it made it too easy. You know, like there was no 
joy in that aspect of the game anymore. Wind because, Waker also had the the symbols on the statues to kind of guide you in the, when you're doing like the change in the direction of the wind kind of thing. You do, mm. you get what I'm saying? Or when you're it showed, yeah, it showed you yeah. the notes to play at some point. But if you wanted to use that spell or whatever you call it later, you could look it up in your whatever you know inventory. It was there, but when you're actually playing it, it didn't show you on the screen. Some super Zelda fan is just throwing his phone on the ground and started stomping on it because he's so angry at us right now. We're are we murdering the the. The IP with this discussion? I have no idea. I, Zelda's I really, are interesting because it, they've had so much time and so many games to right. really experiment with everything, every aspect of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, this was one of the big complaints about Breath of the Wild. I didn't I didn't actually play Breath of the Wild. I did. But my son did, and he played it straight for like two weeks. That's all he did. And then at the end of that two-week period, he was like, yeah, it's not very good. <laughs> I loved it. I absolutely yeah. loved it. But I mean, it's it's the same sort of how true is this to my Zelda kind of right. thing, you know? Like, because right. uh, he people... he said they took out a lot of the elements that made it Zelda, you know. Which, <sighs> from his argument, I can see that. I can understand that. But I guess I didn't it's, play it myself. So. I'm not as attached to Zelda as some other franchises, so like I could just sure. enjoy it, but if I were to sit here and make the argument like, well, man, people just need to be more accepting and open-minded. Then I, then I have to go back and erase a bunch of podcasts about him eternal. <laughs> so uh, it's opinion, right? Yeah. It, it's totally like, I really enjoyed breath of the wild. I thought it was a fantastic game. I didn't think it was anything like Ocarina of time. Okay. And I was okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, but then you can make the same, like what are the, the true elements that he was citing? Like what, what makes Ocarina, great that's right. different than you know a link to the past uh, i mean i'd probably yeah. have to question him about that but yeah from my understanding like you didn't have to pass through all of the trials in order to get to the end of the game like you could kind of just skip stuff mm-hmm. you know so there was no uh he said all the zelda elements were done in the, on the plateau you know where you're kind of unlocking features and yeah. After the plateau, it was kind of just everything open. Um, so it didn't follow the same sort of script as the yeah. previous. I mean, they definitely rolled the dice, man. They tried something sure. new. And, oh, right. it did well financially. <laughs> yeah. Too. So yeah, of course. Not be that. But uh, I love the idea of open world exploration, though. Zelda, I think Ocarina of Time was one of the first ones where we really got the sense of the vastness of that land to explore yeah. you know uh, once you get out of the initial uh, forest area you got and you that. get to travel through time and like exp- yeah. they can re- so instead of changing everything up what they do is they reuse the same map but make changes oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah and it was that a cool concept. genius genius but I mean, I that game that... was my child that was okay 90 94 95 it probably came out like right around the time I was born, but that was like the popular game you know, right. when I was a little boy playing video games yeah. for the first time. I played and, it on recommendation of a friend and I didn't think much at first. I had played up to Zelda, the third Zelda, you know, the first, mm-hmm. second and third. And I loved those, but I wasn't convinced that the 3d was, a, was going to, you know, stick. <laughs> Man, were you wrong? <laughs> um, no, but that that feeling of getting out onto Hyrule Field and just yeah. seeing like you could go any direction, and there's even an up and a down, and like there were those big helicopter things flying around. That was just yeah. intense. Like I was just in love with it at that point. But uh, so yeah, we're trying to recapture this. that kind of feeling in a game is is yeah. is hard. But that is that's definitely one of my goals. We were talking about the storage (laughs) in Star Explorers. It got all the way to the (laughs) Not supposed to talk about inventory when we talk about our video games. I forgot that rule. Like inventory, yeah. It's in there. Don't worry. (laughs) It's not that exciting, though. Um, Yeah, it was kind of a a fun little feature that I added. What else did I add? Why are you not supposed to talk about it? Because every game has inventory. It's like... If you have to talk about inventory, it means you're making something that's really not that interesting. (laughs) 
Well, I mean, it, it's it's super interesting. That, that's ridiculous. Is that like a a rule amongst you guys? Like uh, well, you unless all? there's some super awesome feature in your inventory that makes it different. Is there a secret handshake that I need to know? To uh, this is just some wisdom I've heard from game designers who talk about their games and because like uh, in, a, in a game pitch, you don't talk about inventory. Gloomwood, right? Like they've well, they did something new. They did yeah. something very unique. I think. Super cool, um, man. The the crazy brief the little thing f- open yeah, flips around. F- folding open box thing. Yeah, that, that's pretty cool. I guess uh, having an in-game reason for my storage to be linked with my backpack is kind of different. Because a lot of games will just do that by default. Yeah. Which I never liked. Because it's like, how how is that working? Like, how can you be on your ship and on the planet at the same time? With the Wormhole 2000. <laughs> You've got a reason. So what, from where you are now, what are the, I mean, obviously bug fixes and little things like that, but yeah, like, yeah. what is your vision inside your head of what Star Explorers will be as a, com- like, I'm finished. Plant the flag and walk away. Uh, uh, that's a good question. Because the ideas, unfortunately, come faster than I'm able to implement them Mm -hmm. because it's it's a galaxy right like there should be no limit to how much stuff is in there as long as it matches the overall feel of like exploration and not guiding the player too severely uh, i would be happy to add ideas to it but i think um once the 5.0 release comes out which should be during the summertime sometime, mm-hmm. most likely. Uh, I will probably put it down, uh, depending on how it does from a worldly financial standpoint. You know, that could totally change my opinion. But assuming it's going to do roughly the same as it's doing now and just kind of, you know, pick up a few players here and there. I'll probably leave it alone for a while unless and until I get some super awesome idea that would really change it. But uh, right now, all the ideas I have are just kind of expanding on what's already there. Yeah. You know, a little more variety of this type of thing or a little more, you know, detail in that, whatever it is, little tweaks and, and new you know not, nothing major gameplay wise trying to keep the gameplay most mostly the same but uh yeah it's yeah Th- when you say like it's a galaxy there should be no limit like that's really daunting it is and but yeah. i I've, i encountered one of my first uh or more recent uh what they call emergent pieces of gameplay which was one of the first times it kind of the game took me by surprise recently. Uh, it used to do it all the time because I didn't really know what to expect. But uh, when I added the meteors, I uh, and this is going to seem really kind of boring, maybe from from someone listening on the outside. To, but to me, it was exciting because the meteors I assigned the same uh, like skill number as the rocket launcher you know, the rockets. And I didn't think of this, that this would happen, but when it hit one of the rocks on a planet, it exploded that rock and left some, you know, debris that you can pick up, uh, like ore or whatever. And I hadn't intended that, but it's obvious why it happened. It's just when it happened, I'd realize, oh, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. And that's always cool to experience those little things that happen organically that you didn't really plan on. Yeah. You have successfully created a universe when things like that happen. Stuff, there something un- like unintended that. Unintended yeah. consequences. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. So I have to say because of my profession. Yeah. If I boot this thing up and I see a tornado happen in a way that it's not supposed to happen. Oh, I'm going to let you know. Oh, dang. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, um, these are not realistic tornadoes. In fact, no, they, I'm just messing with you. They, 
<laughs> I, I made uh, so yeah, I I made storm planets because I mm-hmm. hear about these planets like exoplanets and even like Neptune. The winds are supposed to be like thousands of miles an hour, right? Yeah, and I didn't think that made a lot of sense for this game because that's like a gas giant anyway. Uh, and currently you can't really interact with the gas giants other than crashing into them. But, um, so I made some planets have like super high winds. So you can have up to like five, like four or five tornadoes at the same time, like flying all over the place. Uh, but then there's like normal planets that have normal wind speeds, but occasionally those might have storms and tornadoes as well, but usually just like one tornado. Right. So it's like not quite as crazy, but uh, yeah. So there's like different levels of uh, wind and storm damage and and effects. So I was thinking, I haven't seen this yet, but like a tornado planet that is also dropping meteors on you might be kind of fun (laughs) because it could theoretically happen. Right. It, It wouldn't be common though. I hope it's not too common. Because that would not make it as exciting. So, how much uh, research did you do in you know? Because it, it's not just the the weather or the meteors or anything like that. It's um, you know, different planets and the way that they interact, the way they orbit. Uh, and then to go even further, the the different atmospheres that you've created. Where you know, okay, so there's certain type of rock here, no atmosphere, or there's sure. like uh, you know. A chemical in the air that is poisonous to people. How much like did you? How much effort I, did you put into? That? I would say I did the. It's a game, yeah. Right. It's not science, but I love reading about science. So whatever I added to the game, it was just very unscientifically putting it in in a way that made it. I tried to make it make it sense internally. You know. So like, it's logical, it's just not necessarily accurate. Yeah, okay. yeah, you could say that. So yeah. like the the if there's a planet and its atmosphere is oxygen, right? I know like the Earth isn't, It's a, it's got a nitrogen atmosphere and it has some oxygen and that's what our body needs. But, you know, you're not going to find an atmosphere that's pure oxygen, most likely. That doesn't get you really high. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> It'd be but, the funniest planet on yeah. ever made. Right, right. <laughs> But in the game, that's what you get. You get an oxygen planet, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not it's not scientifically sound by any means. I did sign it up. There's a thing called... There's a thing called... Uh, oh, dang, I forgot the name of it. It's like a STEM-based video game uh, kind of... What's the word I'm looking for? You can edit this part out. <laughs> no, I might leave it just because it's funny. <laughs> I don't even know what this thing is. It's like a, it's some kind of effort that some science and math and whatever groups are putting forward to get STEM into video games. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. STEM being what? Uh, science, science, technology, technology, engineering, math, yeah, math. Right? So I signed up Star Explorers as a game, and they're willing to give out like grants to help you fund whatever you want to do. Uh, so I was saying like I could take Star Explorers from the very gamey sort of logic it has and convert it into something much more scientific. So, you know, you would have different uh, percentages of uh, nitrogen and oxygen and whatever in the atmosphere. And it would take account of those things and, be, you know, be more subtle and more uh, accurate mm-hmm. to, to what happens in the real world. Um, but I haven't heard back from them. So I think they're making their announcements sometime in the next month or two. So that would be kind of cool to get a grant to kind of science it up, right? Potentially. Yeah. But even... I, uh, finish. Uh, I mean, it might ruin. It might ruin the game. That's my one concern. <laughs> it might be very scientific and accurate, but it might ruin the gameplay. But we'll see. So, That's future me's problem. 
I mean, you hear people like like Neil Tyson is like kind of infamous for you know, ruining science fiction movies because he's like, yeah. uh, you know, that's not that's not accurate. Uh, okay, but I think yeah, you're. But he like he discredited Godzilla, and I think that's just stupid because what what? The... <laughs> Sorry, like okay, yeah. If if that was a lizard with a lizard skeleton, of course it wouldn't be able to be that big, right? But this is if you can imagine a. 300 meter tall lizard you can also imagine maybe its skeleton is made out of some substances that normal animal skeletons are not made out of and i did a little research and i found that that the strongest known biological compound is called is limpet teeth like limpets are little sea creatures Mm -hmm. and their teeth are made out of this compound that's like stronger than almost that's stronger than like regular steel it's like super strong so if you made a skeleton out of that which a biological creature can make then maybe you could support a 300 meter tall nuclear lizard right i mean we're we're digging into territory here that's like okay on one hand it's it's a giant dinosaur movie. Like it's supposed yeah. to be, you, you let your you let yourself go and you just yeah. enjoy it for what yeah. it is. Like suspend your hand, disbelief. Yeah. On the other hand, if uh, if we're trying to make sense of it, then it depends on which uh, canon of Godzilla, because there are multiple ones yeah. that you subscribe to. So there's the Godzilla was like an iguana or whatever on an island and then the nukes fall and radiation. None of that makes any fucking sense anyway. But like if you subscribe to the idea that Godzilla is a mutated lizard, yeah. then okay, whatever. Um, I like the recent, the more recent way that they've been dealing with it where they're sort of these kind of Lovecraftian gods, right? Like the Kaijus right. are like these ancient, unimaginable, unscientific entities that are, beyond our understanding yeah and just and then you don't need any fucking explanation just go wild and have fun right um and i like that much better it, it is more compelling i think yeah that they are ancient a- alien creatures yeah you know that or maybe they're from earth but they they evolved outside of the normal uh biological process that we know yeah uh yeah that's definitely more interesting have you seen um Shin Godzilla. The best Godzilla, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're in agreement. Man, we, we agree too much. Got to argue about something. What? It- I, this is not the first time Shin Godzilla has come up on the show, ironically. Oh, dang. Uh, I think it oh, was. With me? No, no, no. It was me. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. He's like a TTSP. God damn it. I'm going to sound like the Sentinels Playground. It's a, like a free online hosting service for Doom. Oh, okay. Uh, so like you can put, you know, you can host servers on Xandronum. And they provide the server network for it. Really great guys. Nice, nice. Godzilla fan. Huge, huge Godzilla fan. And we were just going in on Shin Godzilla, but we can do it again because you know who knows when some, last time somebody listened to that one. Yeah, it was a long time ago. But yeah, Shin Godzilla is definitely the best Godzilla. It's super yeah. cool. It was. It, it was basically a remake of the original. If you want to kind of look at it, yeah, it was called Resurgence or Re. Like I forgot what Shin means if you want to translate it, but uh, it was not, uh, I speak Japanese. <laughs> it meant like reboot almost. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken. Hold on. But the the social commentary is what I, I really loved enjoyed it. about it. And I, I I'm on a Godzilla group on Facebook, and you you get all all perspectives are. on these things. So the, the bigger complaint in it is, yeah, too much people, too much talking. But man, I I loved the people scenes they were hysterical they were funny they were like quick-witted yeah and it it put everything in a context and i thought that was amazing filmmaking to be honest like not just the creature it wasn't just about the creature it was like the whole picture if i understand correctly and i could be totally wrong on this but i believe that it was intended to be satirical of the way that the japanese government dealt with uh the the nuclear reactor yeah and uh, explosion and or meltdown i don't i don't know anything about nuclear reactors but but i have seen some pretty cool video games and movies about it <laughs> sure so i'm an expert anyway but 
the fact that they they denied it as it was happening, you know, um, and that's what's happening in the movie is that you know the right. the, the presidents or whatever prime minister whatever they have, he's sitting there saying like, oh, we, the scientists are all saying it can't possibly come on land. It's not, and then as it's happening in the background, <laughs> like he's standing up and walking on land. <laughs> He evolves, right? He yes. evolves. So the, yeah. the problem doesn't stay the same while you're denying it. I think it, I thought it was excellent. Just as yeah. a and just funny too. Like like the I don't remember the scene exactly, but you know, they're in this crisis situation and I forgot exactly what happened, but the guy's like eating ramen noodles and commenting on the deliciousness of the ramen noodles in <laughs> it was it was very well written yeah you have to the, watch it the way that, that i understood too. it was that um and this is true of many it's i'm not shitting on the japanese government i don't know anything about the japanese government right, right? but me neither they apparently had this issue where um the politicians have all these different agencies right that control everything just like our government does and sure there's this boardroom meeting when they first realize, okay, there's something, there's this giant kaiju thing and we had to deal with it. And they, they keep arguing about which department's job it is to deal with it. <laughs> right. and, and they're like, Oh, that's not our department. And like, and it just goes around and around. And, and there's a, there one like very intense talk and meeting. And then they, they finally make a decision. And the decision was like to change rooms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was classic. That's um, great. That's another movie you can't watch with like a big group of people. Though I tried that, like I had some friends over, and you know my wife and her friends were there, and we're like, "Oh, let's watch a movie." And the kids were like, "Oh, let's watch a Godzilla movie." Because yeah. I was kind of indoctrinating my daughter at that time into Godzilla, and so we were watching Shin Godzilla, and it just didn't didn't work in that group setting where people wanted to have like conversations or whatever on the side it, it was more like you have to actually pay attention well to really appreciate it or it was just yeah. like we're hanging out and there's some giant monsters in the background like, like right, a baseball right. game <laughs> like, yeah, no, oh it doesn't work that way um and i i'm not a big fan of the newer the legendary pictures godzillas mm-hmm. i thought they were okay uh i i thought skull island was the best of that so far with with kong I haven't seen Have the Kong seen? movie. I'll, the Kong I'll watch the pretty good. Kong versus Godzilla though, because Adam Wingard is the director and he's like one of my favorites. But I, is it out yet? I don't think so. Okay, I, yeah, I feel I like I would know. I, so I hope. I'm <laughs> keeping an eye on it, but uh, I probably won't see it right away because I don't have HBO. But uh, yeah. you know, when it does become available, definitely it's on the list. Well, I have HBO, and I love Adam Wingard. He made one of my favorite movies of all time, The Guest. Um, okay. He also made uh, a couple others. Uh, Your next was really cool. He did a Death Note movie for Netflix that was kind of underwhelming, okay. but and then a bunch of like weird indie uh, horror stuff, like ABCs mm. of Death. He was in, and I just the only one I've heard of is amazing. Death Note, and that's from my yeah. teenagers. They they like that, but they don't like the the live action stuff. That's what he did the live action yeah, film, yeah. and people it was kind of a wreck. But I mean. You're, if you're ever going to make a live action movie out of an anime, you're set to fail. I think right <laughs> from the get go, but like, you know, make your money, bro. Right, right. I watched it. I thought it was okay. It wasn't anything to write home about, but the, your, the guest is easily like top five best movies ever for me. It's, it's like if, okay. uh, if Michael Myers and the Terminator had a baby and Yikes. it was per- perfect, just perfect movie. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> uh, I saw Halloween when I was in third grade. And it was on TV and my parents, my brother convinced the family to watch it. He's four years older than me because, you know, it was cool back then for, for people his age (laughs) to watch this. And I, I don't think I've ever been as terrified. I wasn't terrified watching the movie. I was just like kind of wide eyed, just taking it all in. And Uh, I remember like trying to go to sleep that night. And man, ever since then, that movie has terrified me. Just, I remember the first time I watched it too. So this is actually, I, I can't wait for my parents to text me after they hear this. So the first time I saw Halloween, <laughs> yeah. I, my, so my dad's house, we all had cable and everything. And I was like, it was like late at night and I'm like browsing through and I'd never heard of Halloween or anything, but I'm like, 
you know how like a cable will give you like the descriptions like R and then like tell you kind of like letter code sure. Y and it said nudity. And I was like, Oh, I could see boobies. And that's why I watched oh. Halloween. And it's like oh one God. scene. <laughs> you went up the wrong street there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was great. I enjoyed the movie because it's okay. awesome. But. How old were you? Oh, I was probably like 12 or something. Okay. I don't know. Some, yeah, I, some I, I, I reasonable age to be interested in boobies. <laughs> I was too young. Like third grade was too young to see that and not get scarred for life. <laughs> that was like <laughs> While we're on this tangent, uh, yeah. when I was about 10 years old, I met my mom, bought a new house and we moved mm-hmm. into it. And the very first night we were in there, we set up a TV and everything. And she watched the original Amityville horror with me. Oh, and fucked my brain up permanently. <laughs> in the brand like, new house. huh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was terrified like i just could not go to sleep yeah still to this day like i think that's one of the scariest movies i've ever seen yeah um and I, i've watched it since then so I'll, I'll still stand by it it's i mean it's made in the 70s and it's low budget but it's just good like yeah yeah that's that's how i felt like with halloween i did watch it again and i remember i'm watching it again and it wasn't scaring mm-hmm. me that much but then later it's yeah. like oh <laughs> i'm i'm really interested in john carpenter doing a game soundtrack i got because he's a fantastic musician and did all these scores for uh-huh. i mean he may have done a video game for all i know but i yeah. i've just that's one of my things that i do like when i was studying or something like that i just put on john carpenter's music and go and i didn't even know he wrote music i know really? i know the thing i know thing was uh, any americone princess that's like princess the one John Prince Carpenter movie he didn't do the score for. No kidding. Yeah, the thing is any American. Okay, okay. Uh, it, it, I mean, somebody correct me if I'm wrong here. No. Yeah. I'm wrong. Okay. The the mist or the fog or whatever. <laughs> Whichever oh, the one he fog. did. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. One. That's that's any American. I'm sorry. Okay. The thing is definitely John Carpenter. John Carpenter. Completely oh. misspoke. Someone, I didn't even realize. I, I, I threw their phone down and broke it again. Uh, yeah. You can I'm only. Sorry. Pay attention to so many things, right? Like, yeah, of course. But that's, that's just that's the the soundtrack to Halloween is just John Carpenter playing the piano. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, all, yeah all that, the that's a scary one. Those notes still give me chills. Like, I don't, I, don't, I avoid them. Mm. <laughs> Escape. I remember I felt very safe at one time, and then like after what, like twenty years, they released Halloween four. And it, suddenly there's the TV commercial playing that song again. I was like, yeah. ah, turn it off. <laughs> the uh, the recent Halloween that yeah. came out, uh, I think it was like 2019 or something. The Rob Zombie one? No, 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 no. no. That was a, the Rob Zombie was like a remake of okay. the franchise and he did two of them. And I liked the first one a lot, but I mean, mo- I get why people don't like it. Yeah. I, I'm just a big Rob Zombie fan anyway, but the, uh, it was, I, I gotta say it was 2019, but Halloween is called okay. Halloween and it's a, it's directly, it's a sequel as if none of the in between movies. It's like oh, okay. Halloween one, this movie, like, Oh, wow. and, um, a sequel reboot. Yeah. A C, a C boot. I don't know what you would call that. <laughs> so interesting. I'm going to make sure I've got my, I'm just going to cheat and look at the internet. <laughs> Make sure I have my facts straight before I start rattling stuff off here. It was in 2019. And no, not Halloween. What the fuck is this? <laughs> Halloween Party, the movie. Oh, there you go. That was it. That's Halloween what you're thinking of. 2018. It was 2018. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. But Jamie Lee Curtis is like um, an old lady now, as sure. she is in real life. But she's permanently scarred by the events that took place. And sure. So the movie is about as am I. Yeah. (laughs) The movie is about her granddaughter and, Uh. and, and her daughter kind of uh, peripherally and how uh, Jamie Lee Curtis after this, her character had become like a, like a, a doomsday planner essentially. Like she, you know, was the house is like, she's training the kids how to like shoot guns and kind of like uh, steal off perimeters. Yeah. 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 And interesting. And she's like, you don't understand. He he will come back. And they're like, no, he's been in prison forever. And then obviously on Halloween night, uh, they're supposed to be transferring him. And then, oh, he gets out. And it's just fantastic. Really, really good movie. 
interesting. My PSA for the public listening is don't let kids watch these movies. <laughs> That's my, my personal opinion. You seem like you're well adjusted. You're fine. You yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did make it. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe. If you hadn't seen Halloween, maybe you wouldn't be here making your game right now. I might have so. walked into some creepy house at night, not realizing the dangers mm-hmm. and been murdered. Right. But how did <laughs> I'm trying to find a way to get back to, to the games? Right. <laughs> it's not working. But so uh, my games are scary to my kids for well, whatever reason. That was never intentional. I remember. Um, being a little kid and pl- I can't remember what game it was, but just like the vastness of outer space mm. is absolutely one of the most terrifying things there is. Like that's fair. Yeah. It, it's a different experience. Like, so it's so like uh, when you're watching something like star Trek or whatever, it makes it all, it's all action. They got everything figured out. Sure. Physics and, but well, it's also like a living room, right? Mm-hmm. Like the yeah. enterprise is just posh. It's such a nice ship. But in in Star Explorers or in No Man's Sky, which is the the low budget Star Explorers, as far as I'm concerned, um, <laughs> you you're alone on a space. I think I mentioned this earlier, but you're right. totally like, and you're out in the vastness of space, and everything is trying to kill you. And I totally get why that's terrifying. It honestly sure. like is one of the things that I like about it is that at the, it's you're, you're in a survival situation. If you run out of Echnexium, you're fucked, yeah. and you're going to die and you've got to figure out like, you're almost engineer. You're applying the scientific process of, all right, how do I get myself back to either safety or find more Nexium crystals with what right. I have currently? And that's what I like about it, man. That's yeah. such a beautiful thing that, I mean, that's kind of one of the, the hallmarks of the game, like mm-hmm. not hand holding the player and not trying to make things just, too easy you know like the goal is to find this fuel source like i can't put a marker on the planet that has the fuel source because then you wouldn't be accomplishing the goal yourself you would have been given the goal like the answer like and i remember some players early on were very upset about that like tell Mm -hmm. me where to go it's like nope (laughs) that like there's one thing i'm not going to add to this game is like where you need to go like you have to figure that out that's your that's your job. <laughs> like, this is the game. <laughs> well, that's that's the first thing because when I was playing, it, I'm like uh, for the first little bit there, I didn't even I wasn't paying attention to the fact that you could run out of fuel. I just thought like this is right. just going to fall out right. of my ass. And then I ended up in one of those situations, and that's where it was like this is this game is fucking cool because all right now I've got to figure out how to like get back to the mother sh- find some way right. out of this situation. And I, I've never actually died in the game. Like I mm. st- through my entire playthrough, sure. I, I managed to not be dead. I think, I think the second playthrough I, I died like once, but I was doing something okay. dumb. Like I, I purposefully like, what's that like? Yeah. And yeah. well, you can yeah. get achievements by dying too. <laughs> That's, that's really good. I mean, I don't know if that's just being cheeky as a game designer, but I felt like it's interesting. If you can enjoy dying in a game, it, it makes the game more fun, right? Like, I remember playing Unreal Tournament and getting hit, like, mm-hmm. directly with that nuclear missile thing. I can't remember the name of it. And just, like, flying across the map as a rag doll, and the camera's following me, and I'm rolling over and I was like, that was fun. Like I didn't mind losing that match because that, that was a payoff. Like I got to see my character just get blown up and that was great. Yeah. I'm not a big unreal tournament guy, but like quake I've been in sure. many situations. It's just the hilarity of that moment is yeah. Like, yeah. there's a, there's a map in quake called blood. No, no, no. It's not blood. It's molten falls and quake champions. And there's this area where it's like an open back, like you can fall off the map. And there's a mega health underneath a, a kind of walled in area and mm. a jump pad that leads up and away. And it's just a small rectangular area. But I had this uh, match with a good friend and a lot of people were watching us like we were just goof- goofing around. But he kept coming out of the mega health and running and jumping up the jump pad. And three times in a row, I would just stand there with a laser gun, like the lightning gun <laughs> and just push him off the map. 
just just lift him up right. in the air and push him off the map. And it just it was that those moments are what makes Quake uh, really special yeah. for yeah. especially if you're not super competitive about it anyway. Right. The Redeemer. Yeah. The Redeemer was that nuclear missile in Unreal. I always thought that was a great name. Yeah. That's you don't have to be a good player. You just need the, the redeemer. <laughs> just blow everybody up. But it's fun. I had another thought yesterday when I was kind of thinking about the games and the, the deal with Paradox Vector is it's like experimenting with like non Euclidean yeah. uh, stuff. And I thought about it and like technically Star Explorers is also a game that experiments with non Euclidean stuff because it, when, you're, when you're moving faster than light, you were traveling and you're arriving somewhere before you left. Sure. Yeah. I didn't really venture into the consequences of that. I yeah. took the star, the star Trek approach, you know, like you don't really need to know the details. Yeah. And it's a static, it's kind of a static universe. It's not like you're going to warp into the past. I, I think about it all the time as I'm watching and I'm like, well, yeah. okay. So if you left here and you go there and you're go- traveling at eight times the speed of light, you get there, you know, eight, I don't know, 800 years before you left the last place you're at, but then you turn around and come back like uh, brain turns into mush. I mean, you're <laughs> not really, you're not really going back in time. Are you? I don't think so. If you're traveling faster than the speed of light, you are going back in time. Yes. But not in Star Trek. No, not in Star Trek. Yeah, well, I mean, didn't... there's a few times where they just happen to, like, we're not... Uh, right, like, as a result, some engine failure. Yeah, like, Quark, Quark, when they go back and recreate Roswell. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's one of the best episodes of the whole show. <laughs> that was in Deep Space Nine, right? Yeah, Qu- Quark is... Ta- they're, him and Rom are taking uh, Rom's son to right, right, right. Star Starfleet Academy... And but it's been a while since I watched through Deep Space Nine, but yeah, Mark uh, has a bu- He's like trying to smuggle in a bunch of illegal crap or you know typical Quark shit, and they end up with a little some sort of failure warp drive fucks fluctuates or whatever, and then they're back in like the nineteen forty seven or yeah something like that, which is the year that the Air Force was founded. So then I started having some like okay, what is going on here with the, like, because the Air Force general that's there, he's like smoking cigarettes <laughs> or smoking a cigar. And they're like, what's that awful smell? And he's like, oh, humans used to do this thing where they would use tobacco. Um, it's highly poisonous, but also really addictive. So they just did it all the time. And then Quark's like, if they'll buy poison, they'll buy <laughs> anything. <laughs> and it's, that's great. A little business humans, opportunity. Humans are so stupid. Dude. Those, those ended up being two of my favorite characters. Some of the conversations they had oh, yeah. in that show are just fantastic. But uh, <sighs> I I absolutely love Deep Space Nine. Now that I, now I got past the four, like season four, it just right. shifted into full gear. And I was yeah, like, yeah. wow. It's, it had a little bit of a slow start. I enjoyed yeah. everything leading up to it. But like the first episode is when like the Klingons are just like, fuck it. We're going back to the old way. War taking over Cardassia and everything. It's all like that's when it just goes awesome. And then Worf shows up, and yeah. now him and Dax right. are getting their freak on. And it's just great, just good stuff. Um, there's a book, and this is going back to my game. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called. You might be interested in this. It's called uh, the UFO Experience. You uh, sent Jay- a picture of it, I think. I might have. Or you posted maybe. on Twitter and I commented on it. Because I think that I sent it. you the... It wasn't Bob Lazar. No, it's a J. Allen Hynek. No, no, no. I sent. I responded to you oh. telling uh, telling the world about that book yeah. with an interview that was like some guy who had been abducted by aliens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know okay. Lazar. I, I've watched uh, it's his not Lazar. documentary. Um, it's not Lazar. Okay. I have to double check that. I'll tell you not. exactly who it was. In a second, you finish your story while I do research. Yeah, so the Air Force hired this guy, this scientist, to work on Project Blue Book, and I think there was another project before that, Project Grudge or something. That was either before or after. I'm not. I'm sketchy on the details. Anyway, and he was supposed to report on 
whether there was evidence that UFOs a existed and you know uh, were they something we should research more or just whatever like give your feedback and his personal feedback was like yeah this is something we need to investigate further but for whatever reason the official report was kind of like no this is nothing move along <laughs> <laughs> and he wrote this book as kind of like defending his his view and i thought it, it's like the best most uh I don't know what the word for it is. Like it's it's scientific. It's a very scientific approach to the UFO problem. Yeah. He's not making like crazy claims, but he's saying like we the evidence we have is it exists. Like people are claiming to have experienced these things, right? That is true. The claims are the evidence. And then there's other physical evidence that they've gathered. Photographic evidence. Like he gathered it, it all together and he said a lot of these are mistakes a lot of them have been proven to be hoaxes but there's a good chunk that are unexplained and that's something worthy of study so i thought it was interesting so the uh the guy that i was talking about was travis walton the oh yeah yeah fire yeah, in the sky. yeah and i comment fire yeah. in the sky one of my favorite ufo movies i need to watch it uh I really enjoyed his interview because he's, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't think he's lying. I, I yeah. don't know if he's telling what happened accurately, but I know okay. just like listening to him, he definitely believes what he's saying. Yeah. You know, yeah. I haven't actually seen the interview, so I'll have to check it out. Again. I mean, it's a super long, it's like a Joe Rogan interview. So it's like three hours yeah. long, but it's just very interesting. I've read, I've read his I don't yeah. think I've read his book, but I read like about it, some articles. So I felt like I had enough info going in. But uh, yeah, that'd be interesting to see his actual expressions and stuff. But that movie freaked me out, man. That was that was a good one. I believe they're Definitely doing a remake one. to the movie because he had some concerns with some of the liberties they took. Yeah, no, they took a lot of liberties from what I read. They, like, you know, they. I wouldn't say they Hollywoodized it. Yeah. if you can use that word, but they made it much more dramatic than and more, uh, I guess, hostile than the experience he had or claimed to have had. Mm -hmm. So, but as a movie, it was excellent, you know, without comparing it to the real story. It was still just a really good movie. All right. We, we reached the part of the interview where I feel very comfortable. I'm going to dive in deep. I'm, I'm going in both feet and. All right. Hold on a second. <laughs> Nice. Shit, what time is it? <laughs> it's five. Oh, hold on. I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That wasn't quite as satisfying as your crack sound. I, I need to work on that. Oh, that's okay. Mine was uh, the LaCroix sparkling water Raz cranberry. I've been, uh, I like the Polars. I don't know if you get them shipped where you live, but. No, I don't. I don't know about that. They're another just like zero, zero calorie. So okay. I mix it with vodka. That's like my go-to vodka. Mixer, I see. But really, really tasty. Um, and I think a, a bit cheaper than LaCroix, which is why I switched. Ah, yeah. Uh, I think they're just widely available here. So, yeah. But um, I didn't like them at first. I thought, Ugh, you know, like there's no sugar. But then when you learn more and more about the negative effects of too much sugar, things like this start to taste better. <laughs> just I just like, don't consume sugar. Like, unless yeah. it, no, that's happen, good. Yeah. Like, at all. But unless it's yeah. in some na thing naturally, I can't think of the last right. time I ate something like, I don't like sweets. I don't like mm. soda. I don't like any of that shit. Anyway, we, we just set the stage for like, let's go in deep. And then I didn't do it. So, Oh yeah. Yeah. No, you were, you were going to ask me something. Yeah. So we're already talking about UFOs anyway, and we're talking about a space game. I want to dig into some of the things that you've put into the game that a, I think are really special, but also kind of tie into this subject anyway. Sure. The, um, a large portion of star explorers is finding these kind of ancient civilizations that no yeah. longer exist. And I mean, have you seen ancient aliens? Like it's like the dumbest show ever. I know, no, but like my mom gave me uh von Daniken's, Okay. Chariots of the Gods when I was like five years old. Oh, 
dude, Magician, so, uh, Magicians of the Gods by... I haven't read all of them. I remember yeah. Chariots of the Gods, Ancient Aliens was one of them, I think. I don't remember the titles exactly. But I read like three or four of his books. I mean, and then, yeah, good that, stuff. That stuff fascinates me more than anything else. And Okay. When they, the research that had come out in the past, I don't know, five years or so about the the younger Dryas period and the, you know, the comet that probably hit the poles and it made the Western United States what it now is and killed most of the megafauna and and such. And then looking at architecture from around that time, um, you know, Gobekli Tepe and the pyramids of Egypt. And, you know, we're, we're about to go get on our rocket ship and hit warp drive for sure. (laughs) (laughs) I, I don't, I don't, necessarily subscribe to the belief in ancient aliens. Mm -hmm. But I I like, at least in his earlier books, I think he kind of went away from this maybe in the later ones, but in the earlier books, he was very insistent that this is a hypothesis. You know, the ancient alien idea is a hypothesis and it's something that can be, we can investigate these phenomena through this lens to see if it has any validity. And I like that. I'm open to that for sure. So the, the proposed idea behind it's Graham Hancock wrote magicians of the gods and several other books to you on the similar subject, but it's not that aliens uh, visited Mm. or anything like that. It really has nothing to do with aliens except for one part, um, which I can explain after I, give you the initial part, but it's the uh, civilization existed long before we currently think it did. Um, so, oh, okay. Pre Atlantean civilization or something like that. Exactly. Pre flood. Yeah. So yeah. the, the great, you know, Noah's flood or yeah. whatever you want to call it, uh, or Gilgamesh's flood. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. They, of- they both reference the same possibly the same event yeah uh, man i could go on for days yes sure. exactly and the 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 book itself looks at things like uh the sphinx in egypt okay yeah and the last time that there was any kind of flood that could have eroded the sphinx the way that it currently is is uh, more time than they give for the creation of the sphinx in oh, okay. like, most uh, you know, uh, Egyptologists, is that what they're called? Egyptologists. Yeah, yeah. Th- th- would say. And that time period lines up with the, the flood, right? Like with this okay. great impact. And then the, so somebody was making a giant lion statue there long before. And then the reason why the Sphinx's head is so small is because it was probably, you know, the head was fucked up in some way. And then later on, uh, one of the pharaohs, whose name I forget, or whatever, yeah. just decided that he wanted to put his head on it and had him do it. So okay. that that's what I'm getting at. So in the in your game, you find all of these you know ancient eroded civilizations right. that are kind of like you know, Mayan or Egyptian themed in some way, and the idea that you know an entire planet civilization is just gone from existence. Right. Right. Um, d- did you intend to invoke that kind of thought or was it just like a natural thing for you? Oh, I mean, definitely that worked its way into it. Um, I like the idea of finding a civilization on a planet that doesn't even have an atmosphere anymore. And that yeah. can happen randomly, you know, like on Mars currently. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's showing how a, you know, the age and the changes over time. Uh, and you know, part of the game, part of the point of the game from like a more artistic standpoint is kind of to a, I'd love to inspire people to get into actual space, you know, through science, through whatever engineering, Mm -hmm. because I feel like we live in space, you know, we're on earth, but we live in space. We're in, we're here already. It's not out there. It's not far away. We're in it. So we should be 
it makes sense for us to engage with our environment, you know, yeah, and to learn a learn about it and be able to explore it. You know, that's it's there. It's just sitting there waiting for us, right? <laughs> the I mean, if I could live a different life, like I had to pick what time period I live in and everything. I want to fast sure. forward to, you know, Warp once we're a space. Well, one, yeah, Star Trek first. Con, I want to be there. Uh, no, was it 2058? No, no. Like when he launches and the Vul- like the Vulcans find us. No way. The warp drive when you have like living room like features in your spaceships. <laughs> um, that's I want to be that's where I <laughs> an arch- I want to be an exo archaeologist, right? I right. want to be the guy who visits planets that have you know ruins, sure. and figure out what the hell happened to these people. Because right. we right. can't even do that currently on our own planet. We, we still don't know what happened to you know all of these sure. dead civilizations. And I think that's the most interesting thing. And that's how you would figure out, like, well, what can we do to avoid these? Yeah. Uh, you know, was yeah. it a meteor impact? Was it a flood? Was it, did they burn their atmosphere off? Did, what did they, you know, fossil fuel, whatever. Um, that is like the most fascinating idea in the world to me. And because we don't even have the human context, we can't make all these assumptions about, like, well, they lived like – similar we do they were about this stage in evolution like nothing just what happened here yeah Yeah. the other major thing is kind of like appreciating what we do have because i've seen this it's almost like a false dichotomy where wherever there's like an announcement like oh spacex did this or nasa did this Mm -hmm. i see people commenting like there's people on earth that don't have their basic needs met but we can send rocket ships up and do these things right mm-hmm. uh and i feel like that's a bad false dichotomy to set like yes there's definitely injustice on earth and it needs to be addressed but you don't have to stop science and stop progress in order to do that like you need to i'm not going to tell you that i know how to solve the problems <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's 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 a problem like but it's more about will than it is about the means. Like we can, if we could put our energy into that, yeah, we could solve those problems, but we're just not doing it. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't learn about the place we live. Yeah. You know, like it could be, there's an asteroid that NASA will discover that would have obliterated us if we're not looking for it, if we're not out there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, did you keep up with the Amoamoa? No, a little bit, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's extraterrestrial. Like it's not necessarily that I think that particular object was extraterrestrial. It's just the, the fascination of like, well, what if it were? And like, no, that that, would we even know like that kind of, um, that's a good we don't, and yeah, yeah all of that. Because uh, let, let's say, let's just theorize that, like the what's his name, Avi Toem or what? I, I don't remember his name. Was the guy that was saying like oh, we should investigate this because it, you know it's moving way faster than anything we ever usually see. It's oddly okay. shaped. It's you know covered in ice, so potentially it's something that's in there that's been frozen over. But like, what if it were uh, like a broken off piece of a Klingon starship or whatever that's flying through our atmosphere from some war that happened a, yeah. you know, a million years ago. And it's just been flying across sure. the galaxy. Uh, that is just as possible as it not being. <laughs> right. Considering yeah. the vastness of the universe. And I think most scientists are even on board with this. Like it's yeah. kind of absurd to think that there isn't life out there. Mm-hmm. Right. Because why would it be only here? That, that there's no explanation for that. Like why anyone would believe life would only occur in one place when you have this billions and billions of galaxies. It doesn't make sense. So, yeah. So with your alien cities, right? So are you interested in the idea that there there are different clans and different like differently evolved aliens from different there are or there are okay uh and i I actually this is one of the more recent updates i did is basically just names and dialogues Mm -hmm. with anyone you encounter so like the npcs on the mothership 
you can talk to them and they have like a randomly selected group of phrases that they'll tell you. And it, some of them are like gameplay hints and some of them are just kind of lore building, you know, uh, stuff. And so you can just kind of learn about the environment in the game, but then each alien. And I, 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 I I'm kind of proud of this. I took a bunch of different names, like first names, male and female, and then last names. And then whenever you meet a character on the mothership, like it will randomly select a first name and a last name. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you'll have your name, their name printed out there. And so like, I, I tried to cover as many different cultures and stuff as I could. So I just went like on Wikipedia and like looked up the most popular names in each each language. I'm sure I didn't get everything, but I tried to get as much as I could. Uh, and so you'll see like just totally random names like Muhammad Jones or something. Could you know? <laughs> yes, the, the Polynesian like, aliens and the, the, <laughs> the Arabic aliens. Well, no, these are the humans. These okay. are the humans. Okay. So okay. it's in the future. They're, you know, the cultures have kind of people had to start working together at some point, right. <laughs> to get on this mothership. Uh, but anyway, like, so for the aliens, I have three different intelligent alien races in the game, which you probably, I don't know. You might not have come across all three of them. So while, I, I don't mean clear about where I'm at right now. Yeah. I've played through the game twice. Right. I am waiting for 5.0 now. Okay. Like, I, I yeah. want to have the full experience. No, no, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't, uh, I would say that's the best approach, but there's some players who like to test out the new features right away. So mm -hmm. I'm more than welcome. I, I usually would, but like, I'm excited. Like, yeah, I don't oh, know cool. if that's a compliment yeah. or not. It's, it's not like I, 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 I take it as one for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there were like three different bipedal alien races. Mm -hmm. Uh, and one of them is like lizard, you know, rept reptilians, as they would say. Uh, then you had the greys, the kind of featureless, big eyes, those guys. And then you have these kind of mushroom-headed things. And I so I... I what, what, if, what if intelligent life were fungus instead of... Yeah. Animal? Yeah. Well, that, that Lovecraft talked about that. I think the Mygo, one of his alien creature from the Whisperer in Darkness. Yep. They were mostly fungus. But, well, see, Lovecraft is so Fungus interesting light. because, I mean, he he lived in the late late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds, and died when he was like what thirty or whatever. Forty eight, I think. Okay, well, still Which not enough time. And Which is scary. the the things like the factual scientific stuff that he comes up with, yeah, given the time that he lived in, is mind blowing. Like it's how could anyone be this like well-read or well-researched? Yeah. I mean, probably because he sat in his room all day reading books, but right. I mean, because we're yeah, he closer was the, related to fungus than like any other yeah. form of life. Right. Wild. Yeah. Yeah. So, so each of these alien races now will have their own sort of dialogue yeah. that they'll engage in with you. So you can kind of learn a little bit more about them now. And they each have a different, set of names that they will randomly select, you know, for each alien NPC. Uh, but some aliens are still hostile. And so you can't really talk to them. Yeah. But uh, I'm still working on it as far as like factions and kind of teaming up with one group of aliens against another. I haven't, I don't know if anything like that's going to happen. That might be too ambitious. I mean, but putting life in context and I'm assuming you're going to live forever because you should. Um, I'm as interested in star explorers as I am in. All right. When you've put the stamp in this, I'm done. Yeah. I want to see what you could do, you know, with, okay, here's a bunch of money. Go fucking nuts. Like, mm. and uh, here's a team to accomplish your goals and like really see what you could create with your creative mind. Um, with no restrictions or with less restrictions, less restrictions. than you currently have. Yeah. 
I, you know, I think about that a lot and maybe I think about it too much, but as an artist, I always wondered like getting that approval and that money and that sort of success, the worldly success would, would that improve the art? That's a philosophical question. I always ask myself, like, maybe it's just to justify the fact that I haven't reached that kind of level of, you know, uh, accomplishment yet. But it makes me wonder, like, right now it's a struggle. There's a struggle involved. And there's like a goal that is unattainable in a way. And I have to work very hard to do that. Mm hmm. If that became, if those obstacles were removed, would the drive to accomplish it remain, or would that get removed too? Yeah, I, and that's a scary thought to me because I, I don't want my artistic endeavors to be linked with my financial needs, but it's entirely possible that they are. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that's, the the sad clown right or the right. comedians that are like well if i because it's really common trope with uh comics and musicians or art, you know i guess artists in general um you know if i remove the suffering will i right. still be able to create the art and yeah that's a, a not even a false dichotomy that's like very real and some people say like no you can quit drinking and still be funny and then the other people are like um i can never give up my, my demons because without the demons, I won't have anything to run from. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to present myself as someone who suffers. Like there are people who are definitely suffering a lot more than me. Mm, uh, but yeah, I mean, at the same time, like it's, it's, it's mostly just, or it, it is my game development justified by how much money it's producing right now? No. <laughs> but it's your it's a passion. It's, it's a passion, doesn't matter. For sure. Yeah. sure. So there's a struggle involved, for sure. But I wouldn't say it's based in suffering. Dude, like, the, the day that this podcast by the way, thank you for becoming a Patreon supporter. The day oh. that this podcast became something that I no longer was putting money in, like it's self sustaining and it doesn't cost me anything was like I mean, so amazing. That was, I can't wait for you to get there because it just that felt good. <laughs> like, I'm sure it would. I'm sure it would. I, I just, in my mind, I, I think forward and I wonder like, how is that going to affect me? Would I like, just like take it easy at that point? And like, you know. Um, who knows? Unfortunately, no, <laughs> it doesn't. Done. You don't just, you want more. And okay. Or at least, I mean, for me anyway, I'm just like, yeah. Um, Okay, and all right, we've we broke even. Let's make a profit. Sure. <laughs> and then what can I do? So it's not like um, I I've never taken any money from in the keep ever, and I don't plan to for a long time because it's still you know only uh, whatever. It's not enough to live off of anyway. Sure, but it's enough that I can play around with this a bit. Like okay, what can I do to provide people with a better experience? I could invest yeah. in video game uh type stuff like maybe i like i have this wide aud uh not audience but uh, reach now of all these mm -hmm. amazing developers that i really admire who ha most of them happen to be like independent and i'm like oh what if i could help them curate things and right. Then right. use that or you know it could be production like can i make the podcast better can i make a video po which we can do now with this software that we're using right now to record but I haven't oh, nice. worked out all the kinks yet, but you know, give the, make the podcast better. And that's, that's where I'm at. So I feel like when you break even on a game, then, then you're like, okay, well, what can I do to make everything better? Or what can I do to make right. a new game? That's more impressive than the last one. And then you end up in the same situation again. Like you, all right, I broke even on that, but now I have to break even on this. And turn okay. It that's, it. that's a good point. Like you yeah. might become more ambitious and then you'll still have to struggle to get through to your goal. Yeah. I mean, I have a short yeah. list of like, I, I've talked to a lot of game developers and there's ones that I'm like, if I ever have any money, like, <laughs> betting it on them. <laughs> so, That's great. Well, yeah. we'll see where that goes. Yeah, definitely there's there's other ideas swimming around in there. In, 
in my head under my orange cap. <laughs> the this is the the Finnish game jam. Yeah, yeah, the game third, development third place? championship to be precise, which I got third place in the fan favorites category. What are the rules to enter this? Uh, they have it open again. I think you just have to submit your game. I don't think there's a fee involved. So, like, could, G- could Rockstar like just GTA? 6? Well, I think it's um indie, <laughs> okay, studios. I, I don't know how they exactly define that. So yeah, you know, uh, and I, I, I was my my game Paradox Vector was in that competition in 2019. Uh, and it, so it got the third place in which is the lowest placement <laughs> but it's a place in the fan favorite uh portion yeah. so there's like a main uh portion for like where the judges choose mm-hmm. and then there's another one where it's a hobbyist category mm-hmm. and then there's a third category that either the hobbyists or the main uh the, you know indeed teams can qualify for and that's called the fan favorite so whoever got the most votes which i was very happy to see my game got some kind of recognition for that which was pretty cool didn't you make the uh the realms deep participant stamp that people were putting on their games i made a stamp i don't know if it was the same one but i did share it on the on the realms deep yeah it's gonna I be so cool. That was a that was a really that was probably the most presence my games have received throughout their yeah careers. <laughs> I've been experimenting for a long time, or like bouncing this around in my head because I kind of want to have my own award show. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I don't know if I really want to do this, but I've just for a long time thought about it because um, are you familiar with the CAC Awards? I've heard of them. Yeah. So it's like That's the like Do- the Doom Awards, Doom Awards and stuff. Right? Yeah. Exactly. And I, uh, at QuakeCon, I ended up sitting down with a bunch of the guys that are like on the panel for the CAC Awards. And I'm pretty good friends with Major Arlene and Dusum, who are both on the on the staff or whatever the hell they, I don't know how. I think you have to like do some weird uh, skull and bones type stuff with your dad to get in. Could be okay. wrong. <laughs> but, um, but I have like major issues and they, they all know this. I'm not saying anything out of hand but issues with the presentation of the cac awards not like necessarily who they give awards to or whatever but just okay. all right this was established in like the 90s or whatever and how can we bring it into the 21st century so i had all these like sure. let's do like a machinima doom uh like video presentation like like a award show like a proper award show with it and right. because you know not every, it's cool to have like the posts on the website and all that but like what if we made it at a spectacle and then we got a lot more people involved and, and I offered to produce it and everything. And they, you know, like, ah, fuck you, motherload. <laughs> we don't have time for your crap. Uh, th- there was some interest, but whatever. But I, I got so in love with the idea of like, what if we did something like that, that like, I kind of want to do like the keepies or the, the Cathal awards or, or whatever. <laughs> and that would be really fun. I just think that'd be so much fun. And, creating ways to get games recognized or to just, just to like, I don't know. Some people really get a kick out of an attaboy. Like you mm. were just saying, you know, like I, I'm really glad that my little game got some rec- like whatever yeah. it is, but, but to do it in a way that it's not just like a, a bunch of smug old doomers. <laughs> I'm just fucking around with them. They're all great, but making decisions like arbitrary decisions that uh, other people don't get to weigh in on like it could do it like a people's choice awards type thing. Like sure. you're saying where every, like the fan favorite, that, that kind of thing. Right. Well, and, they have the both options, which I thought was kind of neat. They yeah. kind of opened it to the fans, but also have a judge panel. And I've seen that before in like art shows. Like there's a thing in Michigan called oh. art prize where I've, I've submitted paintings to that and got some showings over there. But they have a like a hundred thousand dollar award to the top painting or art piece of art it could be anything. Uh, but then they, so they have a voting system, and then they also have a judge mm-hmm. panel. So they give out two prizes, uh, similar. I mean, do, so do they give you any feedback on like why it placed or anything, or just? 
oh, for the, the GDWC? No, they didn't. It wasn't like a transparent. And that, that is a, a complaint. I wouldn't say I'm upset about it because I, I, I got a prize. <laughs> but, I'm so warm now. <laughs> I, would like, I would love to know how many votes I actually got, right? Like, yeah. I, I have no idea. It could have been five, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, for the, for the audience people. listening, he's wearing an orange like beanie cap. That's. Oh well, it's a it's a snow. What do they call these? Winter cap. From I've Finland. Never, never heard. They of didn't it. just send me a winter cap though. Sorry, I. They sent me. Uh, they sent me a bunch of stuff, like a T-shirt. I got um, a big bucket of licorice, <laughs> and I guess licorice is a big deal in Finland. I didn't know this. They sent me these, like, a lot of these bags of what's called salted licorice. And so it's like licorice, but it's salty, right? It has like a salty coating. Mm. And just to describe, I think the best way to describe this is my seven-year-old daughter tried some. And she said her her reaction to salted licorice was, I would rather not have won this prize. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which is, I, I guess it's an acquired taste that's all i can say well i'm just i'm curious like what about paradox vector like impressed people so much like i mean obviously the art style is like the selling point of the game like that's yeah. what got me to that's exactly why i contacted you in, in fact so i reflected on that a lot because paradox vector you know it it, it sold some copies It didn't go, it didn't break away. It didn't achieve the kind of success I would have loved. But, uh, and I, I, you know, reflecting on it, doing that post-mortem, I think it was what they call like a journalist's game. It had a unique look and kind of backstory to it that was good for writing about, you know? But players didn't latch onto it in the same way. I mean, I enjoyed Which, it the whole time I played it and several of the okay. people that were hanging out with me, cause I always, when I'm playing through something like that, I, I stream it in discord just so like my core group can kind of hang out. And, uh, the, the vast majority of the feedback was uh, not only is the art style absolutely stunning and I can't say enough about that, but the, the level design itself, it, it, maybe it's not the best level design in the world, but the fact that you're experimenting with the, the non Euclidean, mm. uh, becomes more apparent later in the game too is just so fascinating. And mm. uh, my, my business partner here, Gilmo son was just like floored. Like, this is so cool. And wow. I think that's really great too. Just to kind of give you some feedback I, that you didn't get me. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. And, and like marketing is not my thing. So I, I could have like, there might be some marketing thing that people do that I just don't even know about yet. And I didn't realize that I didn't do that. I, uh, but I thought, I agree. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I thought getting the game into the hands of journalists and having them write about it, I thought that was like, okay, that means this game will be seen and people will be aware of it. But for whatever reason, that didn't translate into like a, a major financial success. You also know that I assumed when I messaged you that you were going to be like some 20 year old, right? Of course. <laughs> yeah, like... That, that no, was, I didn't know. That. I don't. I don't know what people assume about me. I. I mean, but. I. I just generally speaking, like somebody's like breaking into the indie game scene. Like, mo. It's not like. Yeah. I'm just trying to broad brush everybody, but like I'm thinking, okay, this is probably some young aspiring guy, like who wants to do something or or gal, and, or or whatever, you prefer to be called. Then you got me. Yeah. <laughs> you got me. Um, um, there's been a few times that's happened to me where I was just like, Oh, this is completely different than what I expected. I think another thing has to do with the art style, because when you look at first person shooters, they weren't done in vector graphics. So yeah. like the retro shooter scene that has happened and is currently happening. Nobody is looking for vector graphics in that. Like that's not what their nostalgia is telling them is a, a boomer shooter, if you want to use the phrase. Yeah, but like, why does it have to be the nostalgia factor? Like, let's oh, right, yeah. sure. 
I, yeah, that I haven't quite wrapped my head around it either. But this is these are the reasons I've kind of gone over. Like people are expecting a certain look and feel, and that game didn't provide what they were expecting. Yeah. So when they see it, they they don't latch onto it and say, "Okay, that's the game I need." Like, they need a different game, whatever it is. I don't know. I, I do a lot of thinking about this too. Is it just like what yeah. makes the genre special or different or where can we go from here and all that. And I'm, I've concluded, like I've kind of come up with a theory or a okay. hypothesis anyway of what I think is going on at, or at least what I find interesting. And that's not recreating what I played in. I didn't play anything in the nineties anyway, so it doesn't matter. But those games, it's taking the principles of game design that were established then, you know, so like what makes a good map, what makes good combat, yada, yada, yada. And then finding what what we can do with that now that we have basically unrestricted technology in, sure. in comparison to, you know, what John Carmack was working on or whatever. And you can do like so much. So you can take these like this tried and true principle of what makes a good game, but you can do so much more, or you can have so much more of a smooth experience. I, I talked a lot about this with the the fellas from <sighs> Call of Seregnar because yeah. you know it's essentially a, a successor to Betrayal at Crondor, and Betrayal at Crondor is one of those games where you're like you know you're just turning and like pushing the forward button to inch forward towards an object and you explore it and that kind of thing. Like a grid based, a grid based. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah I, I played a lot of those like Bard's Tale, Might and Magic. Yeah. Might and Magic is, Might and Magic was a huge influence on the game too, or at least a lot okay. of the fans translate. Yeah. And, but the game itself is like a proper first person, like modern, you're walking around kind of thing. Right. Right. Uh, with, with the retro graphics and everything, but it's like, it makes sense to the modern gamer how to play it. And that's what I think is really special. Um, let, let's go. Another one would be Gloomwood versus Thief, right? Yeah, yeah. The or any any MSM now because the the control schemes in games like Thief and Deus Ex were dog shit, like terrible. And if right. you were to just exactly recreate that experience now, I, I can't say it would be a big market for it. But if you can take the feeling that you created, you can take the the principles that made it good and make it something that makes sense now that's yeah. that's where the money's at right yeah if you can if you can get something at the level of quality people expect and i think that might be a third factor we haven't talked about <laughs> which is like quality wise i love my games but yeah they're 3d game studio they're not unity they're not unreal so I f- and I'm not, I'm not a programmer, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm an artist, so like there's probably some, and I'm I'm improving these things, and I'm getting feedback still, but there's still things that I just don't know how to do, and there's things that people might be anticipating or expecting a way uh, for the game to work, and it's just not responding the way they expect. Well, that's what I was and saying so like, earlier. Yeah. With with you, I didn't mean to cut you off. If you're still no, not at all. So, what could you do if you had the ability to? If you had a team who could right. make that happen, make the things right. that you envision happen without you having to like necessarily figure them out, break yourself <laughs> against a bang your head against the wall trying to figure out how to program it, or or you know whatever. And I'll take you up on that challenge, man. Give me the money. <laughs> I do. As soon as I have it, we'll, we'll talk, but yeah. Well, the other thing is the limitations you talked about, uh, working without the limitations of the past, but I, I think part of art is to have limitations. There's a big philosophical discussion to be had there. Go, go ahead. I'm I'm raising my hand for when the teacher's done talking. You can keep going. Yes, please. (laughs) Okay. I think earlier in my, like what I was trying to initialize this part of the conversation, 
I said like limitless resources. Mm. Uh, right. I, I redact that. Fair. It, I've taken a lot of like actual courses on leadership and everything. That's like a big part of what I do professionally anyway. And you never give people limitless resources. You give them, this is what you have to work with. And this is the goal. Right. And and then you give them the freedom to solve the problem. And that is how growth happens. Right. That's good. So I like that, you know, I could, I could, if I had a million dollars, give you a million dollars and say, do anything you want. No, right. Uh, I wouldn't, that that's not a good way to lead. Uh, what would be a good way to lead is like, here's a budget. Here's a team. These, yeah. each of these people on the team have individual talents that you don't possess. Right. You guys figure out a way to come together as a team and you go through the whole like butting heads and uh, maybe this sure. guy's not right for the job, the you, storming part of the yeah. coming together. And then you come to an agreement and then you make it happen. That's the generalized flow of how that should work. Now, hmm. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how Three Realms does it. I don't know how right. I have an idea, I guess, of how Dave Oshry runs his company, but it's barely even a company anyway. So, uh, but ideally, you know, it's not in a vacuum, just do whatever you want. It's right. Right. You still have yeah. limitations. Yeah. Limitations from that, the logistical standpoint, I think is what you're talking about. And I'm also talking about li like setting limitations on how am I going to make a 3D character or a model mm -hmm. or hallway or whatever it is. Like, and in, in Paradox Vector, I set very strict limits on how I was going to visualize thing, anything. And it was, everything was done with a line draw command in the, in the script. So everything is just a single line and then whatever shaders or, you know, things on top of that. But the essence of each object is just straight lines. Right. Yes. And that, that was a challenge that was almost as hard to do as, you know, doing proper 3d models and stuff. Cause it is a different challenge, but it was equally time consuming and, and tedious which I didn't expect. <laughs> well, e even then, even, even in, take that and put it in the context of a team. Let's say you have a yeah. guy who's a, a 3d modeler, modeler right. or, or say you're the artist on a project and you have no other job other than to create the artwork. Right. Oh yeah. No, All that, right. that okay. would be amazing. So then we say, what is MK Schmidt good at? What are his limitations? Right. Like we, we envisioned we would do this, you know, particular art style, but that's not what we have available to us. What we have is yeah. this guy and he's willing to do the job. <laughs> you know, it's like hiring a plumber <laughs> or, you know, yeah. it, this is something I also struggle with because I've tried to get jobs in the industry. And I, I know as an artist, I'm not quite at the level I would need to be to get those jobs. Like if you look at my portfolio, it's like, Oh, it's okay. Uh, as a programmer, I'm not, at the level I would need to be. I don't know how to do tons of tons of crap. And then when people talk programming, I'm kind of like, oh, I use if then, like, <laughs> and global variables. Like, I'm yeah. just like very basic as far as my programming. Together, I feel like I like working on everything. Yeah. I can, I can visualize a game and make it, and it'll look and feel and play the kind of the way I want it to. And I'm getting better at it, but it's not industry. It's not industry standard. But None of it is so much <laughs> more interesting than so. Uh, Rockstar Games CEO is yeah. here to talk about the next big release. Well, well, how did you make the game? Well, we hired all the best people in the industry. Right. We had the best programmers, the best artists, the be and you know, there's nothing interesting about this story at all. Mm. but hearing people like you, people like Hakita, people like David, like Savansky, like just, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. And I was just <laughs> desperately trying to create something that I envisioned in my head. And I figured it out step by step. And there were trials and tribulations and pitfalls along the way. And like, there's a beginning, a middle and end here. <laughs> like yeah. we have, we have a story. 
so as a, I'm not a journalist, but like a, as someone who enjoys obviously hearing people's backgrounds and stories, it's way more fun. And yeah. I feel more obligated or I feel more excited to put my money in the pocket that I've heard someone who, you know, did a bunch of hard work to get where they are than I do to, well, we had a bunch of money and we hired all the best people. <laughs> like That's just not so fun. I, I, I'm kind of the same way. And then like, I don't really even play a like triple A games just because except Zelda that. and <laughs> all the other ones that we just talked about. Well, I haven't played breath of the wild. Okay. You know, I haven't, I haven't played a lot of those recently. I don't I'm trying to think I definitely will play stalker two yeah. when that comes out. That's going to be uh, interesting. That's going to be great. I won't be disappointed. <laughs> I'm playing but, dark uh, souls right now. Uh, yeah. Because I consider it research, but like a friend bought it for me. And it's like, it's really important. Someone I respect is like, it's really important that you play this. And I'm like, okay. Sure. And which, which one are you playing? The first one. Okay. And I understand why now that I've gotten pretty deep into it. It's because so many independent projects that I have covered and I'm looking into are extremely influenced by this game. Uh-huh. And it's in the way that it, it's mechanics function. Right. So, I'm justifying playing a triple A game by the fact that a, I didn't pay for it and B it's, it's good for me to know. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not making any broad claims. Like yeah. I'll never play them. It's just like, that's not where I find the most joy right yeah. now. I love small, small games. And I don't even unfortunately play a lot of games, even the small ones. I'll play them for a little bit. And once I get a feel for them, I'm usually thinking about how I can improve my game. Yeah. And it's a rare game that keeps my interest through the whole thing these days. And that's not to say that the games aren't good. I feel bad about not finishing games like I used to, but at the same time, I would never finish anything myself. If I finished every game I started, I would get nothing done. So that's a, it's a sacrifice. I kind of have a, I mean, not adjacent, but similar sort of experience in that, you know, you say you play things and you see things that like, okay, how can I apply this to my project? I, I see things. Um, and then I think, how can I help all my friends? You yeah. know? So if I see something really interesting in one project that I'm looking at, I, there's been many nights or like mornings, maybe depending on what shift I was on where I'm like, Oh shit, I got to tell scumhead about this. Like, so that he can improve his right. game. You know, like maybe this principle will be the thing he was looking for. Or whatever, and yeah, that's great. I hope that makes me valuable in some way. I don't, I don't really know, but oh, you're very valuable from from my perspective. <laughs> I mean, you you introduced me to this whole realm of people that I yes. never had any access to. Grovel, you know, the gate, grovel the before the king. <laughs> uh. But yeah, uh, so you know, each person will probably have a different viewpoint. Some people might find you you know, irritating. <laughs> <laughs> Most people <laughs> like stop asking me to do an interview. I don't want to do an interview, but for me, it's like, yeah, I'll do an interview. I'm very happy to. I don't know. I think I'm pretty, I think I'm charming honest. enough. <laughs> it's, I don't know, but I, I've not it's gotten good. a lot of FUs. I don't want to do That's it. Good. I've gotten a lot of like, yeah, I'll give it a chance. And then, and then there's the few people who like really enjoy it like yourself yeah. or, you know, like I've had a few different people that I've like, you're part of the club now. And like, this is good. We have a relationship and I can help you and you can help me hopefully saying that's what I want anyway. Yeah. It's great. I think it, anything works better when there's more than one person like involved in it. And this is something I've, I still haven't learned even as a designer, as a game developer. I know I could make better games if I was working with a team. I'm sure of it. Like, you don't have to convince me. Yeah, I don't think I do. I think it's pretty obvious. But at the same time, like, I have the... uh, Maybe maybe I'm a control freak. Maybe I just like suffering. (laughs) Maybe it offers an excuse for me not to produce as much as I could. You know? Yeah. You know, there's lots of 
subconscious things that might be involved there. But for whatever reason, I, I, I know I want to work on at least this game, Star Explorers, alone. Yeah. I and mean, maybe, after, maybe after I've finished it, maybe that will open my mind to doing more with other people. Well, but. I, I get like imposter syndrome when people say nice things about me. Hmm. But if I do a little bit of uh, mental algebra here, if I were not performing well, I mean, maybe some people don't like it. F them. I don't care. But then I wouldn't be, the, the project wouldn't have grown. If that makes sense. Like I couldn't have gone from interviewing, uh, you know, I don't, I don't mean to diminish any particular guests. Like, we'll use dots as an example because I like dots and he knows I'm not, I'm just fucking with him. But like episode two of in the keep was dots from open arena, which is like this tiny, like little sect of the quake three community. And, like, right, right, and right. to talking to like, would you like I listen to, to that host realms deep? Like that's yeah. two fuller ends of the spectrum. So like, I have to justify like, okay, I have done something here. I, there is something sure. of value here. And, and your, per, your predicament, I guess so that you were just going through with the, I want to finish this alone like that you should. But then there's the what could you do after that kind of question. And if you – even if you were on a team, right? Like you're not necessarily working on something you're super passionate about. Let's say you're the artist for a game and or you know whatever you happen to do. And it's not the game that you envision or you want to make, but you do the best you can and it goes out there. But then that gives you the leverage to then – go on and make what you actually wanted to do. If you make a profit from it. That's, that's like delayed gratification, right? Yeah. I'm terrible at that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. I, I, I know this exactly. It's like as an artist, if someone tells me to make something, even if they're willing to pay me money, I will half ass that thing. <laughs> it's just like, I don't have it in me to conjure up the emotions required to make it good. Yeah. It's not coming from your soul. Right. I, I, I don't know how to tap into that. Like I literally, it's like a failure of whatever. I don't know if it's bad or good, but it's like, cause I have all of these other ideas that I do want to work on. And to me, it's just, it's like, it's, I would rather do something totally unrelated to art for money. Right. Well, you make a decision and, about yeah. how much effort is worth the time I have to put into this or the work I have to put into this. It's, it's, yeah. It, and it's just, it requires an emotional, for me, it requires an emotional commitment or, or you know, attachment at least to you, that project. Do you know the actor Danny Trejo? I know the name. Machete? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. The big, yeah. Uh, like, prison y looking Mexi Mexican guy. Yeah. guy. Yeah. With long hair. Okay. So he, I, I can't remember where I heard this. It's probably some interview somewhere, but he had this uh, theory that he was talking about with acting where I'm like, you know, I, I, he does a lot of movies, like low budget movies. He doesn't care what he does really. It's just like, is it fun to do? And right. he's like, there are projects that you bring your A game for, right? Where, so like if Robert Rodriguez asked me to play Machete, I show up on my A game because I know yeah. this is, I'm passionate about this. Like this is emotionally what I do as an actor, but right. then you get the, you know, the roles that are like a uh, Delta farce with Larry, the cable guy. And he plays like the, the Mexican gangbanger enemy guy. And he's like, okay, well that's a, that's a, a D effort job. And, yeah. and he categorizes it like that in his head is like, I, I don't have to bring everything to the table for that. So, but do you accomplish the goal? Yeah. You make a fun movie, you get paid, you walk away. Um, yeah. And I've done commissioned artwork and stuff yeah. and, I'm never happy with it. And I, I always feel bad taking money for it because I feel like I know I can do better than that. And sometimes they're like, this is great. This is amazing. And I'm like, no, it isn't. But I don't say that. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel bad. It just makes me feel bad. But the customer so. is happy and you've provided them with the service that they paid for. On the outside. Yeah. But yeah. But they, it's just, 
So you don't find joy in making people happy. You find joy in creating your vision. You could say that. Okay. That might be a better way to say all of this. <laughs> could have reduced this whole conversation to one sentence. Thank you. I'm a selfish prick. <laughs> it is selfish. And roll, I, roll that's why I think that. it is a selfish thing. I don't know how to overcome it. Like, I don't know how to draw on that, whatever skill or power or thing I have for someone else's idea. And that maybe that's because I dropped out of art school or like that was like kind of, we were going to learn that the next year or something. And I dropped out before we learned it, but that that's where I'm at. Well, you're, you're not an engineer, right? Like, so engineers like, like, here's, here's a, a problem. Parameters fix the, fix the, you know, get from point A to point B. That's what they like. Yeah. Um, you, you don't, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. I, I mean that, yeah. If you think about it, I mean, and I know there's artists that do work that way. And then this is not in any way to disparage. They're all very successful and have a lot of money. They have probably money and stuff. Yeah. But there's the artists who can't do that. And I feel like the potential gain from having that visionary type artist, and I'm not claiming anything about myself. I'm just saying sticking to your own vision the potential gain is better, is higher, is more, you know, world changing. Well, you, okay. But the stability and the sacrifice involved are higher. And, you know, you the likelihood of failure is higher also. You do, know what I mean? Do you think that when the Italian guy asked Da Vinci, like, hey, can you come over to my house and paint a picture of my wife? Mm. Or, or daughter or whatever the fuck Mona Lisa was. Like... Do you think he brought his A-game to that project? He did. Did he? Da Vinci? I yeah. think so. Okay. Totally. Like, he spent 19 years working on that painting. But but that's the problem. But it's the same kind of thing. It's like, I'm not saying he did or didn't. I'm just saying, like, some guy commissioned him to paint a picture of a girl. That's it. Yeah. Right. Like, he, he, he made it his project. Yeah, it was no longer that guy's project, in a way. He made it his, but like he kind of failed. <laughs> Probably wanted to hang it up at some point. Like, <laughs> can we see this thing? So yeah, that's a it's a unique story. But that's a story I was inspired by. Like I remember setting out, like I'm going to make this painting. I'm going to spend the next twenty years on this painting. And I would end up spending like I've spent like four years working on a painting, and then I'm just like. That's it. I'm done. But I never got to 19 years. <laughs> but he was older than me. So. <sighs> All right. But Star Explorers is approaching what seven, eight years now. Yeah. So. I mean, I was about. I was like literally about to say like, "All right, you're saying that, but <laughs> it's like, yeah, how long have you been working on this one game?" Right. Um, right. Let's take. One short little break. I have one more question that I'd like us to dive into, and then we can call it a day. Okay, yeah. I have to get going pretty soon, but yep. one more question sounds feasible. So the last thing that I wanted to dive into is, are there aliens, and have they been here? On Earth? Yep. In reality? Yep. I mean, if I had to choose yes or no. That's the idea. You got to bet. My official, you, you have to bet. My, my official answer is like, I don't know. But do I think they've been here? I think so. I think so. I can't prove it. <laughs> I've never met one uh but uh, the ancient peoples i think we have to give them some credit you know what i mean mm -hmm. like they wrote this stuff down they felt it was important enough to write and i know a lot of it is probably stories and you know made up stuff but throughout all the different cultures like they're always talking about 
people from the sky. Like, it doesn't, it's not even, why are they always from the sky? Why aren't they from whatever, some other place? I don't know. I, I feel like there's some. There's no religions based around the mole people, right? <laughs> Pretty much, right? There probably are, but I just think that is too consistent and too widespread to not have some kernel of truth in it. And I would say, yeah, there's, there's got to be. And then the likelihood of aliens existing, I think, is also very, very high. So why not? I would push back just a little bit because sure. like in a lot of pagan traditions, the the gods is not always from the sky. Like there's a god mm-hmm. of the sky and then there's a god of the ocean. There's a god. You sure. know, like, so they come from different places, right? Uh, whether or not they're representative or they mean like literally there's like a, a dude who runs the ocean over here. Like, I don't know, yeah. but yeah. I, I agree with you like pretty much a hundred percent on the whole sky daddy thing. Like there, there's too much coming from the sky for us not to think that maybe there was some reason for that, but yeah. And I, I wouldn't, yeah. I'm not someone who, and we kind of talked about this in other, in our other talk, but damn it. I, I don't think that there. is enough to explain away religions either. Like I, I don't take that. I know Von Däniken like to explain away all the religions, just like, okay, it was just aliens. Like that's everything. I don't, I'm not that person either. I think there's, there's certain truths and stuff that are accessible Mm -hmm. to us if we look for them. Uh, And unfortunately science isn't always the best tool for those. Science is great when it comes to, observable, reproducible, physical things. But there's other things in this universe than those. I like, uh, there's a few different moments in Star Trek and especially in Deep Space Nine where they kind of decide to tackle that issue. Yeah. And they yeah. do it in a few different ways. But there's, there's, I can't remember the name of the episode, but there's one in TNG where there's like this planet and everybody's like basically perfect, but they're like death penalty for everything. And right. there, right. it turns out they're controlled by like this maniacal like lady who's posing as their god, right? You know, because she mm. just has advanced technology, and that's a really solid reasoning. Uh, then there's the Bajoran faith, uh, yeah. where they have the the wormhole aliens who are they prophets. respect as prophets, yeah. yeah. And I'm not in any way like anyone listening to this like. I would never step on anyone's religious beliefs uh, purposefully and I have my own too. So it's whatever, but I like that solution that this is not, we we use the word to describe God, like higher being a lot, like doesn't necessarily have to be like the creator of the universe, but something bigger than us that we don't understand that is influencing our reality. Right. But even if the the existence of those larger beings Mm -hmm. can be established, yeah, it still doesn't solve the problem of the creator of the universe. You know what I mean? Like that's those higher beings might be wondering themselves, like who created us? You know, like I I try to hear out everyone's argument because I I try to stay open minded. So I don't necessarily like a lot of what Dawkins and like Krauss say when they're like staunch atheism, yeah. you know, that kind of, right. that doesn't really answer my questions, <laughs> but, but I do give, uh, especially Krauss a lot of respect in his, uh, the, you know, something from nothing theory. Like, okay. you know, if he can prove that in math, I don't know if he can, I barely even read his book or anything, but I've heard him talk a lot about it and I, I'm okay with potentially that is the answer. Potentially that's just, sure that's how it happened but that doesn't i don't even think about religion necessarily as like an explanation of our creation like that's not important as important to me it's more like a, how should i live my life right, right. the wisdom of our, our forefathers or whatever you want to call it, forebears uh the prophets whatever you want to say like just give me some guidance that's been tried and true tested over a long period of time and that's enough well i I, I, I also appreciate the ar- arguments of atheists and agnostics. I was agnostic myself for quite a long time. Nothing they say can solve that one issue of like, I'm going to die. 
<laughs> yes. And then I have to face whatever it was like that. I put my, you know, put my coins in, put my eggs in whatever basket. And yeah, maybe, maybe it's nothing that, what do they call it? Pascal's wager. Like, sure. It might be nothing, but if you bet on nothing and you get something, you're screwed. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I didn't intend to go down the theological path. But I, a, a, I always do. <laughs> I, I'm right there with you, man. Like I, I, literally my friends will like in the middle of a conversation, they're like, okay, let's put it in a theological uh, context. Cause I know you like that. Yeah. Like that, that's kind of where I'm at, but of the you know the many many books you've read and we just we kind of started the topic on that too and the Travis Waltons and the Bob Lazars of the world and everything like what what makes you think like, what of those do you think give us some context for there having been alien visitation to Earth? Yeah, I mean and you're not an expert. You're I, just my friend, so I'm having fun. Exactly, with this. Yeah. I'm no expert, but J. Allen Hynek's book was very compelling. The the UFO experience. He talked about the types of people that reported UFO encounters, the detail, the corroborating reports from different places at the same, you know, of the same event. And it doesn't look like a bunch of people making crap up. Like it looks like there was an event that's unexplained that multiple people witnessed and they're reporting. And like their pilots, their air force people, their you know accountants, their it's like there's this whole range. And then there's some like crazy cranks that are doing this too. Yeah, but that's that would be present if it was a real event. Also, you would get people who are crazy seeing it, but you'd also get an accountant seeing it. You know, like it doesn't make sense. It, the the given like, explanations don't really explain the events. The the when you're going through the reports, right? Within this, you could be a police report or anything like that. You know, yeah. uh, it could be like I reported seeing a robbery. Like you, you're always kind of looking for a needle in a haystack, or rather, a hay in a needle stack, really. And in the fact that for every one person who's genuinely trying to report something, there yeah. may be a hundred or more other people who just want to feel special, right? Like get attention, something. Yeah. yeah sure. It's, you know, or it's, it could be profitable. Like I saw Bigfoot, I saw an alien, like a, whatever there, there are lots of different motives, but I think ultimately it's most, most of these people are just like living. I, I don't mean to sound cruel, very uneventful and <laughs> like not very well spent lives, or maybe they're just mentally ill. And sure. they want to express themselves in some way, and then, or and potentially, they totally believe it. You know, yeah. Like I saw an alien; he touched my butt, and it was amazing. It was the best experience of my life. Uh, I don't know, but yeah, I, I, and I. This could be a human, you know, a failing of mine. I tend to opt on the side of trusting people mm -hmm. until some reason presents itself that I shouldn't. You know, and maybe if I was the cop or Air Force person or whoever investigating that report, I would have seen something that would make me doubt it. I don't know. I, I wasn't there. So, but uh, I, I just don't know why people would come up with these ideas out of nowhere. There's just... There's no number of false reports that makes a real report untrue. If it, you know, that's like you, yeah. if it's a boy who cried wolf kind of thing, like where people are, all right, we're, we're done with that because we, we investigated a million cases and all million of them came back negative. That doesn't mean the next one's not right. true. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. True. It's, and, that, and that's another thing he talks about in his book. He says, yeah, there's a lot of explained phenomenon, but those wouldn't even be classified as UFOs. Right. Mm -hmm. If it's explained, it's not unidentified. Right. And then amongst the unidentified ones, there's somewhere the question, you know, the person, the witness is very questionable and they eliminate those. And some of them where, you know, something else happened and they eliminate those, but they're left with like a good 15% that were 
literally unexplained. And that's a lot. You know, there's thousands of these reports. So just, uh, and you know, you, you can say I'm open to this and I think it's possible without saying it happened. But to the person who actually witnessed it, what are you going to tell them it didn't happen? Like it doesn't, if it did happen and someone witnessed it, then how can I say it didn't? You know what I mean? I mean, let's let's dive into modern culture a bit. We we apply different methods to of belief to different contexts of what is sure. you know. So, uh, trigger trigger alert for anybody listening. You could shut it off right now if you're easily you know upset by anything. We have invented recently a culture of like believe people when they say they have been molested or, you know, in, in any sexual context or whatever, like always believe them and then investigate. Uh, we do not apply that to, I'm not trying to diminish anybody's experience, but like we don't apply that to a UFO sighting, right? Like we just, right. because we've never seen one apparently, like we've never proven one. So we know that sexual assaults happen. We don't know that. That UFOs is a different happen. Yeah. It is a different situation. Yeah. And I think you just explained why. Like, yeah, sexual, sexual assault certainly is a problem. And it certainly happens. And so there's no basic question of, is this even possible? That has to be answered. Whereas with UFO sightings, yeah, we have that. Is this even possible? Yeah. So I understand that distinction for sure. Uh and it really, it, it depends on what, like, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. Are you going to spend millions of dollars researching this? Or is this something we can just say, you know, let's, let's leave it alone. And the Air Force chose, for whatever reasons, to not pursue it because they felt it wasn't... Uh, cost effective, yeah. Cost. <laughs> the um, return on investment was not significant. It, but then there's uh, some people who say, well, they did continue and they just put it undercover or, you know, classified, whatever. So that's also possible. I don't know. There's tons of, there's some YouTube videos about this, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, I had a really interesting conversation with my good friend. Uh, in the, if you ever hang out in the Keep Discord, Donkey is one of the admins there. Mm. And we were just talking about like, you know, how important is humans becoming a space-faring species? And because like right now in our modern kind of zeitgeist, the, the focus is, you know, most people are trying to make the world itself better for everyone on it. Okay. And I think that's, a, okay, cool. I'm with that. Yeah. However, if I'm looking at the grand scheme of things, I'm probably going to get shit on for this, but that's okay. I would say it is almost more important to get off this planet than it is to solve everybody's problems on the planet. Mm. Uh, and I, I'm not saying this is like a hard opinion of it. It's just a thought experiment I'm yeah. going through here. But so should we put our resources towards, you know, cleaning up the atmosphere and getting rid of corruption and making sure everybody is fed and clothed and all and, and the, the obvious answer is like, of course. But I, on the other hand, even if we do that perfectly and we don't put anything toward getting ourselves off of this planet before some disaster happens that extincts our entire race, mm -hmm. uh, then it will all be for nothing. So then right. if I'm hedging my bets, I'd say it's actually more important that we colonize Mars and we get out of the solar system and we spread, yeah. you know, transpermeate the entire galaxy as quickly as humanly possible because that ensures the progeny of the human race. Right. Yeah. If that's the goal, you know, I, I'm with you. I think I think there's definitely problems on Earth that we need to focus and address, but I don't think it has to be at the expense of exploration and study of outer space. I mean, th I think Elon is kind of maybe not like outwardly saying this, and maybe he doesn't even believe this, but his actions tell me, you know, he places a higher priority on getting people to Mars than he does on necessarily getting rid of fossil fuels or whatever because he's launching rockets all the time right. so like right. it's definitely 
burning fuel, the, you know, whatever, sure. uh, even, even the, the argument of Tesla, like, okay, well, we're getting rid of the need for fossil fuels for you know, or gasoline for cars. Well, you still have the, where are you mining your resources from where, you know, all that. So he's just like, he's, he seems to be interested in more in advancing technology to a point where we can get accomplish the goal of getting off the planet than he is in yeah. fixing the planet that currently exists. And, and I don't totally I mean, disagree with it. I don't necessarily disagree, but I, I wouldn't say put all your eggs in either basket. Of like course. You yeah. have to kind of, you have to balance. It's all about balance. Yeah. Comes back to that. Like, I think there's a lack of will in many cases to fix problems that we know exist because the people in power are benefiting from those situations. They're not feeling the negative results. The, the poorest people are the, you know, the, the outcasts and whoever are feeling the negative more, but they don't have the power to change it. So like, that's, that's a problem in itself. Uh, I don't know how to fix that. So, (laughs) but that presence of that problem shouldn't prevent us from also learning and seeking new knowledge and new places and going where no man has gone before. (laughs) Well, I think that about wraps it up, man. (laughs) Yeah. You've been amazing Thank as usual. Uh, it's, it sounds weird to transition into like, okay, we're like, oh, let's close it out now. But like, um, once again, MK Schmidt and the mother load have solved all of the world's problems in only two hours and 40 minutes. Uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> That's please, what they pay us for. Please right? apply what you've learned here to your life. That's what we're, that's why we get the big bucks. <laughs> uh, seriously, you're you're one of uh, I'll say two of my favorite guests I've ever had on the show, and you're welcome back anytime. I can't. I can't really remember. appreciate that you even let me on here and let me open my mouth. So thank you. All right. Thank you very much to MK Schmidt for being on the show yet again for the third time. Although this is only the second one we got to publish because, as we mentioned last one got lost that won't happen again i hope i really appreciate all of you listening to uh you're the your lifeblood of this thing just for just for hanging out like if you really enjoyed this podcast there's a lot of ways you can try to support it if you're interested in that sort of thing go to in the forward slash support or just click on the support tab i uh, highly recommend the easiest way obviously is to share the show just tell other people about it but if you want to give a little bit back Go to our Amazon affiliate link. You can uh, shop through there. It doesn't cost you anything extra. Anything you buy comes back to support the cause here. We really appreciate it if you do. You can also go to our merch store and uh, buy T-shirts, uh, pins. I don't know. I think there's like cell phone cases and some other crazy stuff on there. There's a lot of stuff. Anything you want. We got masks. We got uh, weird tapestries and everything with the Cathala's logo and you have several different options of what color you want it to be and all that stuff so hopefully you find some value in that if you end up doing it really appreciate the people who made this music that we're listening to right now who is that it's actually uncle had up in the keep he was toying around with mk schmidt's awesome software called anomalies which you can get for like three bucks on steam and make some really cool ambient music with it. It just kind of randomly generates it based on the guidance that you input. So consider doing that, man. Another way to show MK Schmidt that you love him. Make sure you're definitely buying Paradox Vector and Star Explorers on Steam. Absolutely incredible, both of them. And Star Explorers is uh, coming along really great, man. 5.0 come out here pretty soon, and we'll have uh, tornadoes, bug free. <laughs> meteors all that kind of stuff you can already see that now if you actually go buy it right this moment the price might go up who knows who knows but it is in fact the no man's sky that i wanted when i originally paid for no man's sky on release so show my boy mk some love speaking of support gotta say thank you to our supporters Paul Moose, Dots, Zach, Alexander, Brad, Red Eyes, Anthony, Robert, Jack, Brandy, Fred, Lord Revan, Tones, Igrak Simon, Immorpher, all of the Flam Fam, and MK Schmidt. <laughs> You're all amazing. 
really means a lot that you put your hard-earned dollar down and say like, hey, what In The Keep does is worth my time. It, it means more than you could ever know. So all that said, please enjoy the rest of this music. I'm out of here. I love you. The Drowned God Cathala loves you. Till next time, stay in the keep.